You guys can't believe it. Today, finally, we're gonna have the crossover you guys all been asking for. And the person I'm gonna be talking to today is, is an IELTS instructor and one of the Niners in Uzbekistan. And I'm having this distinct pleasure, pleasure of talking to them today. And I'm super, super pumped about this podcast. My name is Dior Beck. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm an IELTS instructor by profession. So I've been um, teaching IELTS for the better part of like 10 years at most, like I guess almost 10 years wow. now, a decade. But if any guy from Bukhara went to Tashkent, spoke Uzbek, you could tell he's from yes, Bukhara, for yeah, sure. Yes, for sure, <laughs> for definitely, sure. yes. Um, we have that thick uh, Tajik accent yes. that doesn't in go away. In 2017, I used to teach in Chilanzar, uh -huh. and some of the students used to ask if I was from Nawai, Bukhara. Uh -huh. Because I was, be, me being from Nawai probably affected my accent, but over time, mm -hmm. I tried to make sure that I'm sticking to traditional mm -hmm. standard modern Uzbek. And I thought if I get a really high SAT score, mm -hmm. I'll be able to get into Harvard. <laughs> and my goal was to go into Harvard. Probably because uh -huh. uh, I watch too many movies and stuff like that. Uh -huh. But you know, if I'm going to the United States, I should go to top university. Was my thinking. And plus, we don't want this video to get taken down by YouTube, right? Yeah. Or okay. Any. Speaking of which, taking down YouTube, my YouTube channel was taken down. Wow. <laughs> yes. What happened? I, I learned today. It's not the most, um, you know, good, the best news to listen to. Is that the channel with all the your yes, reading tutorials, yes, explanation, yes. walkthroughs? My God. Yes. That was so helpful. I, it, I see our students watching those videos and getting a lot of help from yes. your channel. I, I used to think that IELTS is a big deal, learning English is a big deal, or being English teacher is a big deal until I started having this podcast and start talking to all these people who come from different walks of life. My experience. For example, when I watch Uzbek podcasts, mm -hmm. like the, there's one or two that I watch. I watch mm -hmm. podcasts called Krultoy. Mm -hmm. So they talk about history. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm never listening to it in one go unless mm -hmm. it's very interesting. I actually opened up about this to one of my staff, staff teachers here. And it was sometime 10, 11, and we were having one of those therapy sessions, yes. right? Heart to heart conversations. And yes. she sat there and she was listening to me. And, and she 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 had that look on her face like is everything okay with this guy <laughs> all right this, this guy's working too much i'm not um marrying someone just because you know, i they happen to think that i'd all tick the boxes mm -hmm. and i think the other person tick all the boxes mm -hmm. well that's very difficult to happen obviously someone mm -hmm. to to have you know you that you know that's cool that and marriage is more than that i believe say this podcast is right now being watched Yes. Most probably by your future you. Yes. I'm guessing you're going to come back and watch this podcast yes. when it's out. So what's one message you have to that guy, to your future self? Hey folks. Hey everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Adustria Muse. I'm your host, Muhammad Ali here. You guys can't believe it. Today, finally, we're going to have the crossover you guys all been asking for. And the person I'm going to be talking to today is, is an IELTS instructor and one of the Niners in Uzbekistan. And I'm having this distinct pleasure, pleasure of talking to them today. And I'm super, super pumped about this podcast. So if you guys are excited, keep watching. And the guest I'll be talking to today is none other than Mr. Dior Beck Haimiratov. Mr. Dyarbak Beck, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Are we finally doing it? Yes, we, this podcast has been a long time coming, yeah? Yeah. I mean, I don't know, things happen in work is probably the main yeah. factor that delayed this, but finally happened. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally get it. I totally yes. get it. If people ask me to come on the show, I usually tell them that I'm busy and that I have to plan like months in advance. So I see where you're coming yes, from. Yeah, I'm not that busy, but mm -hmm. generally I was waiting for my holiday to come and then uh -huh. August came and then I decided to come because I was coming to Norway anyways. Uh -huh. So I decided to visit and you see you guys as well. I right. Share and you. And what brings you, to, what brings you back to Nawai? Um I am not really a wedding goer, but this time uh, a very close member of my family, I would say extend family, uh, was having their wedding and I decided to come and see mm -hmm. my family and my relatives, so that's mm -hmm. why I came to Norway. Um, and then I've been to Bukhara before, but it was a very fleeting visit, short visit. So this time I wanted to see Ark, is it called Ark? So I wanted yeah. to see it at night and people were talking how beautiful it is at night. It was indeed beautiful. 
Did it, did it live up, live up to your expectations? It, it did. I mean, I took a, a, a few photos and it was, um, I decided once I took note, like photos, I was like sitting there for a while, just enjoying the uh -huh. view, enjoying the moment. I sat there for like five minutes mm -hmm. doing nothing. And mm -hmm. it was like, I was proud of the fact that almost a thousand years ago, uh -huh. people from our area were able to build this. And then mm -hmm. there was, it, I, as far as I know, it was an Islamic school. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I looked up some facts on the internet. Because every time you go to Samarkand, Bukhara, and you'll be like, oh, these are the kinds of buildings that our you know, ancestors were able to build. And it was great. Right, right, right. Imagine how wild, wild it would be if we had this podcast on top of that art. Oh, podcast. yeah, I guess. <laughs> that would be great. So if, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, but okay. I saw there is an, uh, like a guest house or something like that, uh -huh. and they have a... Uh, at the top of yeah. the building, they have an open space yeah. uh, restaurant or something that yeah. looked cool. Like with drones around. Yes, right? yes, and yes. That was a beautiful spot. And I, I yeah, we didn't go there. <laughs> right, right. Uh, okay, so uh, would you like to tell our audience a little more about yourself? Because we have some viewers who might not yes, know who you are. Yes, of course. So. Uh, my name is Dior Beck. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm an IELTS instructor by profession. So I've been um, teaching IELTS for the better part of like 10 years at most. Like I guess almost 10 years. Wow. now, a decade. Um, decade of IELTS instruction. Um, I want <clears throat> to again emphasize the fact that I teach only, um, you know, IELTS mm -hmm. res restrictive IELTS mm -hmm. because I've never taught English mm -hmm. as a second language. I believe that's a totally different profession, whereas mm -hmm. IELTS instruction is a different thing. Mm -hmm. And I mainly focus on uh, standardized testing. Mm -hmm. And I run uh, an education center in Tashkent. Um, we are expanding. We are branching out. Oh, congrats! And that's a, yeah, that's a big thing for me for this summer, mm -hmm. probably the highlight of summer for me. And so, yeah, we're busy with the re renovation work. And, mm -hmm. and uh, as I was talking to, I was also on the phone talking to people, uh, you know, commanding and in, in a sense that I've given them, them tasks to, to, the, to the people I trust. So yeah, that's what's happening. Wow. So there is a lot going, going yes, for you right yeah, now. Yeah. Must be so excited. Right? Yeah, it's a new experience for mm -hmm. me. Like uh, lately I've started experiencing new things. Like mm -hmm. I became, uh, I've become an uncle too. And for me, that's the new kind of happiness. Uh -huh. Like I never felt that kind of happy before. So like when I eat Osh, I really get happy. I, Osh is one of my favorite, what they call comfort foods, I guess. Uh -huh. And I feel extremely happy. But when I heard the news of, um, you know, the fact that my brother became a father and I became an uncle, I felt elated and in a sense that I never experienced this way before. Mm -hmm. And it was a new experience for mm -hmm. me because I had some self-awareness to your bag. You never felt this way before. And the same, I'm going into the same terrain right now because um, I've been running this place for, for the past two years. But the fact that we're expanding is also coming with a lot of anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, frustration, and a little bit of fear that what if things don't work out? But mm -hmm. I'm just letting things happen. And, mm -hmm. and like, I mean, I'm, I'm admitting the fact that accepting the fact that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. So, and these are all normal, natural feelings that anyone is going to have. And I am, I guess that recognition mm -hmm. is putting my mind at ease. Yes. Right. So, but yeah, it's a new experience. Hopefully it will work out just fine. We'll we'll get that get to that part in a bit. I would like to talk a lot more about your experience as 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 the as the boss, the CEO of the school you run, and what it's like, you know, and being in charge. But before we get to that part, I was hoping if we could, you know, take a step back and talk a little about your past. You, so you originally come from Navaye, right? Yes. So what was it like growing up in Navaye? So I actually um, am not originally from the Nova city, mm -hmm. um, nor is anyone, I believe, like mm -hmm. in a sense, Nova is a very small town and mm -hmm. people come from different parts of Uzbekistan, mostly people from Bukhara, mm -hmm. uh, some parts of Bukhara, some parts of Samarkand, mm -hmm. and they come to live in the city. This, mm -hmm. The same thing happened to our family. I'm originally from a place called Hatarche. It was once part of Samarkand, but it's now part of Nova. We are originally from there. And we moved to Nawai at the age of five. We had mm -hmm. an apartment. My father bought an apartment, but mm -hmm. we couldn't adjust to life in the city. Then we went back to my hometown, and like which is Khatirche. I'm not even from Khatirche. I'm like from from the village. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, the highlight of my childhood, I believe, I always tell this same story to my 
students was I was a shepherd boy, like mm-hmm. like like in the story, sent you know, um, what's uh, pa- Paulo Coelho book Alchemist, you know, mm-hmm. shepherd he looks for treasure. Um, my grandfather basically uh, told me this, to do the same. Every time I go um, tending to my sheep by myself, I he used to tell me you could see Khazar. Khazar is a type of ma- magical. I guess he's not a magical, mystical figure, basically. Mm-hmm. He, he only sees you if you're alone. So mm-hmm. he's got a thumb, which mm-hmm. is not full thumb. Mm-hmm. But if you grab it, you can make three wishes. Mm-hmm. And as a child, it was a very important thing for me to get him and make my three wishes come true. And I used to shepherd, be a shepherd, until the age of, I don't know, how old is, uh, grade three, 10 or nine. And then mm-hmm. we moved to the city. And then, yeah, I studied in Nawai. But it was great to live in Nawai because back then there were lots of Russians, lots of Kazakhs as well. So not that multicultural, but enough to be exposed to different different people. Uh, you know, there were uh, Tatars, there were uh, Armans, and then mm-hmm. the, a little bit of diversity in Nawai. I'm not sure the same level of diversity exists mm-hmm. now, but back in my childhood, I used to have friends like... Um, like Karim mm-hmm. was, I think that he was Tatar. Um, now, you know, back then I didn't really take an interest in that, but generally there was a little bit of diversity. Right. You said when you and your family moved to the city, you had you had a hard time adapting yes. to this new environment, right? So why do you think? Why do you think is that because of your uh, countryside background? Is that yes, because in the like, fact that you? I think in Uzbekistan there's decent level of localism. Mm. So whatever city you happen to go to, the local population doesn't really give you a good time, I believe. Like they tell you your accent is different, mm-hmm. the way you speak is different. And to kids, this is a big deal, especially kids. They don't know the, I, I believe, what they are doing and the impact, they, the kinds of words and actions they're doing, mm-hmm. um, what kind of impact it has on the child. Mm-hmm. But it was, for me, a big deal because I believe um, it, I wasn't, thankfully I was the, um, strong enough to stand up for myself when this happened, but I had probably a different accent to people mm-hmm. who live in Nawa. Uh, like you go to Tashkent, for example, and people tell you, oh, you have a different dialect, right? Oh, you go to some, mm-hmm. somewhere else, the same thing happens. I, I believe localism is probably the main reason why, oh, like this mm-hmm. was the reason why I found it difficult to adjust to life in Nawa. Mm-hmm. So mainly that plus, um, I think schooling system was a little bit different. Although we lived in the same country, it was like back in my village, we didn't use to write short version of, for example, mathematical problem, right? But in cities, apparently you first write the short version of mm. the problem, mm-hmm. then you start solving. Even that was, uh, you know, something different for me. And I needed to learn that from my teacher mm-hmm. uh, by being tutored by her. Right, right. Yes. So do you still get that sort of discrimination in Tashkent or because there's this one time I had someone else from the region who's you know, super successful, yes. widely successful on the podcast, Mr. Horshid Uraka. Yes. And he was telling me something similar. He, he did make a point of telling me that there's yeah, a certain level of discrimination. Uh, that level of localism still exists, I believe, mm-hmm. but I'm not really, um, guilt, what's the word? victim of that mm. as often as yeah. um, the average person is because mm-hmm. I believe uh, the way I speak mm-hmm. is not really typical of someone from Nawai. Uh-huh. Um, I don't have a strong Nawai level accent, I uh-huh. believe. I, I try to speak according to the conventions of standard Uzbek. Uh-huh. All right, when I speak Uzbek, I, I think um, they might think they have a hard time identifying where I'm from. Uh-huh. Maybe there are a few times I you know, they can know there's uh-huh. a like hinge, what is the word? Hinge of Navayinness uh-huh. in the way I speak, but yeah. generally I don't think they can know where I'm from. So mm-hmm. I, because I try to stick to modern standard Uzbek, mm-hmm. at least the way I think it should be, you uh-huh. know what I mean? Maybe the way I think modern Uzbek should or is mm-hmm. different to how I actually speak mm-hmm. probably. Or sometimes when you use some local slangs. Yes. 
that might give away your identity. Yes, that definitely probably happens. But when I go to, to Tashkent, um, no criticism mm -hmm. of any kind. I just uh -huh. don't don't adapt and then start speaking mm -hmm. like them. I don't mm -hmm. use the Tashkent dialect mm -hmm. because if I'm from Nawai and I don't speak with Nawai dialect or I don't speak with Tashkent dialect, I mm -hmm. try to speak the way Uzbek mm -hmm. should be. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, so some people might think that I'm overly nationalist, chauvinistic uh -huh. in, in some ways because I make a lot of posts of that kind on my channel because I believe um, if you like live in Uzbekistan, you don't have to speak it every day, but you need to know Uzbek, mm -hmm. um, at least to show some respect towards the locals. Yeah, that's what I used to. And then mm -hmm. that always brings about a certain level of heated discussion. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But if any guy from Bukhara went to Tashkent, spoke Uzbek, you could tell he's from yes, Bukhara, for yeah, sure. For sure, <laughs> for definitely, sure. yes. Um, we have that thick uh, Tajik accent yes. that doesn't go in away. In 2017, I used to teach in Chilanzar, uh -huh. and some of the students used to ask if I was from Nawai, Bukhara. Uh -huh. Because I was, be, me being from Nawai probably affected my accent, but over time, mm -hmm. I tried to make sure that I'm sticking to traditional, mm -hmm. standard, modern Uzbek. Right. And at what age did you move to Tashkent? Did it happen when you went there for your studies? Yes, when I finished Lyceum. Uh -huh. It was in 2016, I was 18. Right. I was 18 and yeah, I started living there. First in an apartment with my brothers. Um, my brother was a student of Oriental mm -hmm. um, studies, I guess. Um, and then I moved to the dormitory and dormitory life is I believe something that every student should experience. I extremely like thoroughly enjoyed my uh -huh. time in, in the dormitory. I, I made lots of friends from different parts of Uzbekistan and mm -hmm. it was very nice experience. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I, 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 had a, I had a horrible experience though, staying at oh. my dormitory. And, and part of the reason was because Alicia was my roommate. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> part of the reason was because Alicia was my roommate. Because that guy, uh, along with my other friend, with three of us, they, they used to bully me all the time. They would hide my food. They would make me do all the chores. You guys. <laughs> they would poke fun, fun at me. They would make... They call me names. <laughs> Lived in the Malika like one or yeah, the other one? Yeah, the Malika The, the Malika one. Yeah, that yeah. was a good one. That yeah. was a good one. I mean, I, facilities I were good. Yes. We had our big plasma TVs, study area and everything. But if you end up with the wrong circle of people, yes. then you're out of luck. Yes. <laughs> yeah, doesn't matter how good the place is. You're just going to want to get out of that place. And that was actually the reason why when I was when I was junior, decided to move out. And I did. And that was one of the best decisions ever. Right. Anyway. OK, so back to your experience of uh, can we talk a little about university experience? Like the university you went to, you went to Wyatt, right? Same yes, university, I, I Westminster did. International University yes. in Tashkent. So what prompted you to make that decision? Oh, uh, like in school years, I did not know it existed. Mm -hmm. um, but once I went to Lyceum, um, mm -hmm. some of my friends were like planning mm -hmm. to go. I guess I did know, like now that I think, uh, I think I knew the existence of the university, but I was more more of a, a technology guy, engineering mm -hmm. uh, from engineering background because I was a participant in the physics Olympiads, and I was planning to go to Turin, but that didn't you know transpire, and then I ended up you know life happened and I ended up going to Westminster because I thought the next best choice I have if I'm not really going to the engineering field I'm gonna go and do. Um, I, I wasn't decided on the, I haven't, I wasn't really deciding on the kind of major I would, I would, I would, I would pursue. I was mainly thinking that I will first take the first year and then pursue my interests and then see uh, what that experience brings. Mm -hmm. um, then, however, that didn't happen because in, once I was in university, I thought there's no point in getting a university degree. Mm -hmm. And I decided to drop out from university. Wow. Yes. You dropped yeah, out. Yeah, I dro dropped out. For me, it was the first major decision I made by myself mm -hmm. because my parents were like, okay, you're big. it's your life. You, you, you can, you're going to face the consequences yourself, mm -hmm. but make sure that you will be able to fend for yourself. You mm -hmm. know, um, you are making the decision yourself. So you will be, you know, um, providing for yourself because mm -hmm. you made this decision yourself because my parents coming from uh, a traditional background, they think that um, university degree is important. And but back then I thought, no, there's no point in getting university degree, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to drop out. Maybe I will go to United States, mm -hmm. uh, which, will, which 
did eventually happen uh, to pursue my education. Was your university experience one of the reasons why you decided to drop out? No, it wasn't like, I, I think it's like, you know, it's all about expectations, I believe. Uh -huh. If you have like really high expectations from anybody or anything, uh -huh. that's going to result in disappointment. Uh -huh. so, so you think that the latest release or the, the movie that everyone's talking about um, is like going to be great but the, mm -hmm. once the movie comes out and mm -hmm. it's a shitty movie uh -huh. um, and then it's going to result in disappointment the same yeah. thing happened i guess in my case as well i was expecting the university to be academically rigorous mm -hmm. and but that wasn't quite the experience for uh -huh. me um and i wasn't like the nerdy type as well i mm -hmm. was like i think overall the school is one of the best in Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. i believe but i guess i had overly high expectations and that probably mm -hmm. led me to decide, you know, I think I need to drop out. Um, I, I totally understand if your major was business, but you studied there. Only the like first entry level education, nothing yeah. specific, uh, general you education. You should have only, probably yes, waited yes. until you moved, moved up levels. So you should have probably waited until you became sophomore because the first year is they treat all newcomers nice. Yeah. Show them a good time. They have what's called the induction week social life yes. events and everything and the second year is where it all starts yeah you, you start getting lectures seminars deadlines assignments the, 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 the problem was i was going to major in computer science but they didn't have computer science computer science they had um oh. like business mixed with computer science or something like that and yeah. i i didn't think that was the right mm -hmm. uh, major for me and mm -hmm. i decided to drop out and focus on um, mm -hmm. things. I didn't know mm -hmm. what the, I'm not one of those people who makes mm -hmm. plans ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I mean is I don't believe that you can make plans for, for the next five years. And then, mm -hmm. then maybe if you believe in that, uh, if anyone believes in that, uh, it's okay. But I believe life happens to you mm -hmm. and then it's, life is a happenstance mm -hmm. and you simply react to it in the mm -hmm. way you, you do with the, because something is going on in your head, all these chemical reactions mm -hmm. and make you feel a certain way. And I, I guess at the time I made that decision with the, you know, with a certain level of experience and the certain level of chemical reaction going on in my head. Mm -hmm. And I decided to make that decision, mm -hmm. but I never, to this day, never regret the decision. Mm -hmm. I, I totally see where you're coming yes. from when you say life happens to you, because looking back, I also realized a lot of the things that happened in my life, they didn't happen um, because I made certain decisions, not necessarily because I made some decisions that uh, nudged me in certain direction, but rather because of uh, random coincidences. Like the fact that I got into university was pure luck. Hmm. So uh, the year when I got into university, I really wanted to get a scholarship and there were only 20 scholarships for students from regions, right? And I... I, I had IELTS 7.5, but my math was a little sketchy. Mm. So I, my teacher wasn't confident I was going to get in. My parents weren't confident I was going to get in. But for some reason, I had some confidence. I went there, said the test with my friends. And, and there was like 20 of us, all, all brilliant guys. They're great in math, great in English. IELTS 8 and two, three years of experience, background in math. And for some reason that year, the Wyatt math exam was tough. Tough. No, normally, normally they, they, they ask you logic questions, right, for scholarship, exam, scholarship exams. But that year, we got questions on uh, tri trigonometry. We got questions on a little bit of calculus, and we weren't really expecting, right? And the top result that year was 60% out of 100. For math. Yeah, while all other years, it was 99, 98, 100, right? Yeah. But, and this year it's 60 and I happened to get 45%, which, <laughs> which, uh, and, and I miraculously get the 20th place, 20th place out of 20 scholarships. I get the 20th wow. place, right? And if that's not pure luck, if that's not just a coincidence, I don't know what is right. And me getting in my second attempt, 7.5, barely getting 7.5. That was a mere coincidence. Or me getting nine in my first, uh, that, that one of the first niners, that was a mere coincidence. What, I, why I, do you I, think? Didn't you work towards I, it? I, I did, but what are the odds your speaking score gets upgraded from eight to nine? Yeah, that's, that's very rare. 
to the, the point it never happens. Exactly. Yeah, yes. What are the odds? That's yes. just it's impossible. So uh, when I think about all these uh, moments I had in my life, I realize that uh, as much as I'd like to think I have control over life, I really don't. Yes. I really don't. Like I was listening to Robert Sapolsky, one of the uh, famous behavioral uh, scientists, and he was telling to Huberman, I guess, mm -hmm. that you have um, zero. You, have, you don't have an iota mm -hmm. of control mm -hmm. over your life which make things meaningless if that's mm -hmm. true, of course, like mm -hmm. if you don't have any control over your life, because we like to believe that we are uh, keeping life in check, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but he was saying that all of these, um, you know, hormonal changes. And then I guess this happened to me recently because my weight varies quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's because of my habits, obviously. I don't um, have fixed regular sleeping patterns. I sleep mm -hmm. uh, very late. And that obviously has an effect on my weight variation. But generally, I, I felt like because there was lots of hormonal change and the way I was behaving and the way I was feeling during the day um, was significantly affected by that. And so, th so you wake up sometimes feeling a little bit agitated, a little bit angry in the morning. And then you then let that happen. If you're not conscious enough, you could let that happen and dictate the way you talk to your parents, mm -hmm. dictate the way you talk to people you work with. Mm -hmm. And I think that's too bad. Mm -hmm. So, but that's not, you're not really consciously doing it. It's usually because mm -hmm. something is going on in your head. Mm -hmm. I think that does affect you to some degree. Yeah, yeah, for yes. sure. That's the limbic part of the brain. I guess that's what, yes. what they call like the part of the brain that governs emotion, feelings, how we feel. Yes. Yeah, right, right. But th this is not to say that like, like you said, we don't have any control at all. Yeah. I feel like like we have to do our part yes. and just hope for the best. Yes, exactly. Right, right. And going back to your university experience, so once you dropped out, like how, how, what happened? What was next? Like um, what was the next place to go? So university chapter yeah, closed? I was a really naive school kid. Uh-huh. And I thought if I get a really high SAT score, mm -hmm. I'll be able to get into Harvard. <laughs> and my goal was to go into Harvard, probably because uh -huh. uh, I watched too many movies and stuff like that. Uh -huh. But, you know, if I'm going to the United States, I should go to top university was my thinking. Uh -huh. And me and my, my friend, Muhammad Ali, yeah, man, he's now in the U.S. Uh -huh. but uh, Not me for the not, record. Yes. <laughs> not this Muhammad guy. Ali. He, he happened to drop out from... University of Diplomacy in the same year. Uh -huh. We didn't know each other, so I went back to my hometown, and we got to know each other because I he made a like kind of uh, announcement in different mm -hmm. parts of Navai saying mm -hmm. that he's going to teach SAT, mm -hmm. and I was like interested to see who this guy is who mm -hmm. wants to teach SAT in Navai because it wasn't common at all. And then I called him, and and we got to know each other. We started training. We started reading books, preparing for SAT. And he and I applied to universities. He applied to 20 universities. I did, I, I did apply for one or two. Uh, I didn't apply for many because I didn't do a good enough job of preparing for SATs, but he did. He got three or four SAT subject tests, and he got a really nice score for SAT one. Mm -hmm. But he got rejected from all of them. Uh, so did I. But it was more like disappointing for him because he put in a lot of work. But once that happened we got our rejections and it wasn't really the nicest experience because you were waiting what if the next approval like acceptance comes from the next university right rejection after rejection back to back and then he decided to go to some uh, university that offers scholarship based on his SATs but it wasn't like a really popular one it was just a regular you know college in America he decided to go there, but I decided to stay stay in Tashkent. You know, mm -hmm. I decided to stay in Uzbekistan, then move to Tashkent to mm -hmm. continue teaching. But yeah, then I started um, teaching in the education center in Tashkent. And after a while, um, and I'm giving this very like squeezed version of it. I'm like, mm -hmm. if, it's, if I go into details of it, I think it's going to be um, you know, a long story. So then I started teaching on my own. And I, as I was teaching on my own, I decided to apply to the same university he applied to. And, and I went, I, you know, I happened to get my visa approved as well. You know, wow. at the age of 24, uh, I dropped out from mm -hmm. semester at the age of 19 after five years. Mm -hmm. uh, as a mature student, mm -hmm. I went to United States to start my degree in computer science. 
Wow. Um, and for me, this time, it was just to go to the United States because it was my dream the whole time mm-hmm. to go to the US. Mm-hmm. I wasn't really interested in being a student anymore. Mm-hmm. This time, student visa was just the reason I want to go to the US. I don't care about the degree. I don't care about anything the college has to offer because I was 24, all the other kids at 18 and like 19 or 17. And yeah, and then I decided to study there for a while, but drop out from uh, the school like that I got accepted to, to do trucking. I was going to be, Uh you know, I decided if I want to make it work financially in the United States, what I should do, I should get as much money as possible Mm -hmm. in the shortest span Uh uh, of time as I can. And then what I did, I did a bit of delivery work. It wasn't bringing a lot of money for me. And okay, I'm going to do trucking. But I went to truck school, did two lessons, didn't like the experience. And I thought maybe it, it is time for me to focus on what I'm, uh, what I've been doing this whole time, which is mm-hmm. teaching. Mm-hmm. I wanted to start teaching, like doing online courses and stuff in the United States. But I wanted to have a bit of break from all that, a lot of decision making because it was a lot of decision. It's a, it was a big decision for me to go to the United States at the age of 24, and and then to not pursue education, like I mean, the computer science education but to do online teaching, right, mm-hmm. in the United States. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to come back to Uzbekistan to have, to have some break, but that break extended to now, and I happen, stay, I happen to stay in Uzbekistan. Wait, is your visa still valid? No, no, not anymore. Like it's, like it's, it's, it, because all the, I believe, visas issued to Uzbek citizens are only valid for one year. Right, right. So that means that door is now closed. Yeah, no, I can apply. I need to see what my visa status is like. Uh-huh. I just want to apply for tourist visa just to mm-hmm. see, mm-hmm. Um, you know, because I dropped off from, from university and came back. That's it. Mm-hmm. I don't know what happens to people like that because most people overstay and mm-hmm. that's a different experience. In my yeah. experience, I came back and lots of people were asking, why did you come back from mm-hmm. the United States? Isn't it the place of dreams and stuff like that? Exactly. Yes. Uh, but <laughs> You for have me, to be out of your mind just yeah, to yes. drop that visa and come back to Uzbekistan. I mean, to a lot of people, that's dream come true. Yes, I believe, I do believe that America, I guess I, some people get offended if I say America. Okay, the U.S. Uh-huh. is a land of opportunities, they mm-hmm. say, and I believe it's true. Mm-hmm. It is true, but maybe not now because the economy is not doing really well in mm-hmm. America and with all this political, mm-hmm. um, you know, usual nonsense that goes on in America uh, because Americans are so divided to the mm-hmm. point that, you know, everyone hates each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't like that experience as well because, mm-hmm. you know, they are so polarized that you are as an immigrant, you know that you are being hated in some parts of America, not mm-hmm. in, a, in, in every corner of America. So I was like, okay, my logic was that it's better for me to face racism in America mm-hmm. than to face localism in Tashkent. <laughs> At yeah. least I'm facing racism in a much better life yeah. in my head. So I was like, okay, I am facing localism in Tashkent, mm-hmm. you know, from these local people, not all local people, you know, mm-hmm. most local people. And I was like, why don't I face racism in America if I mm-hmm. happen to be living in such a place? Mm-hmm. But if you really go to a liberal state in America, um, so people are not that you know racist, I believe. But if you go to really white, white mm-hmm. uh, state, probably you're going to face, especially if you look the way I look, I look Asian. Mm-hmm. And, and then I, I guess um, you're going to get a bit of racism there, mm-hmm. you know, because there was uh, after COVID-19, there was a bit of Asian hate uh, going on, like even mm-hmm. black people, you know, mm-hmm. I, ironically, uh, it's funny that I, 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 black people were hating on uh, Asian people and beating the, uh, you know, <laughs> shit out of them. Honestly, that happened. I saw a lot of videos. Yeah. And yeah, it's funny that happened. This racism thing, don't you think it's racism, discrimination, it's all natural, that inbuilt feature of humans. Because if you think about it, you get, you get, we get even discriminated by our parents. If, if there, if, I, I, if, if I don't think it's an inbuilt feature. Uh, I, I think it's more of a thing that you teach. Like there are so mm-hmm. many videos online you see where a black kid mm-hmm. liking mm-hmm. A, like a white person, et mm-hmm. cetera. There are so many videos. It's just... Um, at school, we get indoctrinated, mm-hmm. all right? You are the best. All the nationalists and chauvinist ideas mm-hmm. uh, taught by our respective countries. Mm-hmm. I believe humans innately 
don't um you know hate anybody we don't have an inclination to hate mm-hmm. anybody mm-hmm. it's just either your parents teach you okay you're not supposed to like it's then it's not they're not teaching you directly by the way they act by the way they make decisions by the way they talk to other people you start seeing the pattern and you start behaving the same thing mm-hmm. be- behaving in the same way i believe so uh, i don't think we uh, um you know born with that feature mm-hmm. basically no what i meant no that's not what i was implying what i meant to say was like the way we are brought up, like if you happen to live in a, a five-person household, two parents and, and three children, uh, your parents invariably treat you or your siblings better than others because of the circumstances, mm. right? And that s- treatment s- somewhat translates into discrimination and it gets mixed with your pers- your insecurities, your fear, and it amplifies and turns into discrimination towards other people and you know takes on different forms right but uh, ultimately what i'm trying to say is the root cause of it is that um, treatment we get at home that yeah. eventually uh, manifests itself in the way we treat uh, people uh, in our outer circle obviously i believe if you get a lot of love and compassion from your family members you're going to show a lot of love and compassion for other people too mm-hmm. so it's like it just depends on the kind of background you're coming from mm-hmm. so i believe most of the people in the United States and it's coming from a uh, I, I want to tell this with a caveat that it's coming from a very short experience mm-hmm. of living in the United States I didn't live and st- I don't think I even lived in the United States mm-hmm. more of a stay than living mm-hmm. honestly so it was like really short um, and for me based on my experience I believe um, Americans are taught I believe black people are systematically oppressed. At least I thought so. Mm-hmm. Um, um, like because they live very poor lives, I feel I felt sorry for them, and I wasn't really happy with the, what I saw in, saw in black culture. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's all pus- part of the system. I believe like mm-hmm. they, that's like they might say someone might someone like uh, very conservative uh, media personalities could come out and say oh can you tell me this law and that law where mm. we have specific mm. aspects only for black people and for white people mm-hmm. they might say that but but it does exist i believe in mm. the, in the in the way the system is built i believe yeah. there's certain level of discrimination i believe right right yeah it's a it's a very sensitive topic yes yeah we're we're supposed uh, to we, we, we <laughs> yes. went off on a little tangent here yes. <laughs> sure it's like i guess you need to learn to be politically correct uh-huh. so what i saw yesterday i saw the uzbek trainer uh-huh. answering very politically correctly mm-hmm. um the the in, the journalist from gazette was asking what do you think of this boxer f- from this country al jazeera uh, no no, no the other one the other one from taiwan uh-huh. uh right from taiwan in our sp- athlete female athlete apparently um fighting her Mm -hmm. and then she lost Mm -hmm. what do you think of it and the trainer the coach the main coach answered in the most politically correct way possible he said i don't know that's the political there's a political committee and they make the decision and i think we all abide by that and that was it. Mm-hmm. Okay, he didn't go into the details of what should mm-hmm. and should not happen. Mm-hmm. I was, I was like, okay, that guy is media trained. I said, yeah. Uh, like, I, I guess if you get your media training, I guess you can give such mm-hmm. correct answers, and it's better for us to stay, uh, stay clear of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and plus, we don't want this video to get taken down by YouTube, right? Yeah. Or okay. any. Speaking of which taking down youtube my youtube channel was taken down wow <laughs> yes. what happened I, I learned today it's not the most um you know good the best news to listen to is that the channel with all the your yes. reading tutorials yes. explanation yes. walkthroughs my god yes that was so helpful i i, it, I see yeah. our students watching those videos and getting a lot of help from yes. your channel that happened i'm gonna have to write an email explaining uh-huh. to cambridge that uh-huh. I got copyright strike from Cambridge piracy. Apparently, mm. it's a it's piracy. I, mm. I I I can see how it's a piracy, uh, but I, my goal wasn't to spread the material with mm-hmm. the goal of spreading it. My mm-hmm. goal was more like a reaction video, basically. Mm-hmm. I thought mm. so. I'm gonna see what what this email does. Like I'm gonna write an email, explain that. Okay, I'm I'm sorry for that, and I didn't know that. Let's mm-hmm. see what you know YouTube 
response. Did you reference the books properly in the description box? No, I didn't do that. Uh, that was the problem. Yeah. That was a, we got a lot of copyright strikes on this channel for using soundtracks and sounds that we didn't have license ownership to. So, uh, and that was one of the reasons why our channel doesn't get monetized. It's still not monetized. We took down all those uh, videos and soundtracks and still channels not monetized. So, and we learned if you properly reference the, the, the footage or the soundtrack you're using, you're oh. in the clear. You're in the oh, clear. Oh, okay. Right. So um, I, I need to mm -hmm. write an email. Like, and like those, some videos you see, like Watch Mojo, they talk about different movies and they yes. use scenes from Hollywood movies, the Marvel, and they mention the source. Ah. Like Walt Disney or they say uh, Paramount Pictures, they, they say Universal, they say Sony. So oh. th th it's all so referenced. It's both in the description and in the in video, the, right? In the video. Okay. I, I don't know the specifics, honestly, but you just got to have a reference list like you would when you, you, you know, the, when you do your assignments at university, you have a yes. reference list. I guess that's how it works yes. with YouTube too. Anyway. I need to write an email because yeah. it's, uh, it's not really the best news for, I guess. It, it, no, it's not. Uh, not not for for Isles community. <laughs> for sure. It's a big loss, guys. Right. I think we should do some kind of a, a petition to yes. bring that channel yes. back. You guys, sign that petition. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. You're going put it, to put it, put, put it on your channel, okay? We should, let's sign yes. that petition. Let's do it. Let's get some, let's get some uh, help, support from our audiences. So I, I was wondering if we could talk about the, the, your, the period, the days leading up to you founding your own school. Like before we talk about your school, the school you're around right run right now, you used to work at IELTS Zone, right? Yes. What was what was that like? Your experience of working at IELTS Zone and working with Mr. Big Zod? Yeah, back then it wasn't even called IELTS Zone. It was just uh -huh. two rooms um, mm -hmm. with him working by himself. Mm -hmm. um, and then I I was curs exchanging correspondence with him mm -hmm. on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Back then I used to use use Facebook. And then because I was part of the channel called IELTS, it wasn't even channel, it was a group. It was called IELTS in Uzbekistan. And the way he used to post the latest um, questions. And I used to keep track of the latest questions just to know what questions I appearing and I was preparing for the exam. Mm -hmm. And then once I got my IELTS score, it was an eight. Mm -hmm. And I decided to write to, to him that I, w I was a student in Westminster and I want to work with you. And we talked and then, you know, we clicked mm -hmm. and we started working together. Mm -hmm. And he had two rooms and in one of the rooms he used to teach in the other room I used to teach. Um, and then over time, mm -hmm. there were more students coming in mm -hmm. and in the, the, the education center mm -hmm. um, expanded. Mm -hmm. And but it happened to coincide with my deciding to go back to Nova. Mm -hmm. So as, as they were expanding, I went back to Nava'i and then, and I told you what happened in Nava'i and when I decided, when I couldn't enter universities in the US, mm -hmm. I decided to go back to Tashkent and I joined them again. Mm -hmm. I taught there for a while um, and working with him was a nice experience because I was, I guess, one of the main teachers um, because um, I had so many groups that there were month when I taught until 11 p.m. Wow. Yes, I was so, hardworking at the time. Um, You're not hardworking anymore? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I'm, I am, I guess I'm one of those people who never avoids work. Uh -huh. If that work is not overly physical, mm -hmm. I, I don't think I avoid physical work, but if I can use my mind, mm -hmm. I don't really agree with those people who say that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. mental work is harder than physical work. I mm -hmm. think if it's overly difficult physical work, it's more challenging than yeah. mental work. Or wait until you hit the weights, yes, right? <laughs> yes. So I was teaching until 11 p.m. I remember I had one group I taught and I was the one who was closing all the doors and mm -hmm. leaving um, at, at night. And then it was a nice experience and I thought it was time for me to start working on my own. Mm -hmm. And he gave me the go ahead. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, left on really good terms. And mm -hmm. then, yeah, I started teaching on my own. Then I went to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. So he was fine with you leaving, right? And yes, he was. He, he mm -hmm. did offer mm -hmm. a better offer. Like he yeah. put a better offer on the table, right? Like, like a pay like, rise. Like, a pay rise. A promotion, and, yes, right. Something like that. But in the, but he, Isle Zone wasn't Isle Zone 
it is right now. It's they, mm -hmm. are, they have now five, or I don't know how many brands they have. Uh, but overall, it was nice working with him. Mm -hmm. I, uh, the reason we start working together, the way we looked at IELTS was pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. I thought if it's the Cambridge language assessment making the test, you should use materials, at least talk to people who come from that background. You know, who worked in that uh, establishment, in that department. As far as I know, Cambridge Language Assessment is not-for-profit department of Cambridge University Press mm -hmm. or Cambridge University. No, not Cambridge University Press, Cambridge University itself. And I was mainly using materials from Cambridge Language Assessment and Cambridge University Press because Cambridge Language Assessment and Cambridge University Press are two different departments of Cambridge University. Mm -hmm. And and we saw eye to eye, mm -hmm. and we start working together. Or do you think that distinction is really important? Because I think it's really trivial. The, the difference the between Cambridge University Press and Cambridge Language Assessment. Yeah. Um, I I think the kind of people who work for Cambridge Language Assessment are the people who make the test that students use in the IELTS exam. Mm -hmm. Various Cambridge University Press might not necessarily be the same people. Mm -hmm. uh, because Cambridge University Press, if you look at the books, the latest book they um, made was IELTS Mindset, as far as I know, 2019. I didn't really like the book. But 2012 one, Complete IELTS Series, they have three books in the series. I really like that book. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the authors, um, and then you check their LinkedIn, uh, they are kind of linked, affiliated with the Cambridge language assessment as well. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they are the same people. Mm -hmm. So, but they are all, however, but it's much better than using Kaplan mm -hmm. or Pearson or Thompson mm -hmm. or some other, some other stupid publisher. Oh, not stupid, some other mm -hmm. third party publisher. Uh -huh. Or is that because they are somewhat non-standard? Yeah, that they, are, don't they make the test adhere to oh, yeah, overly difficult. Uh -huh. Mo in most cases, overly difficult. Um, not e overly easy. They make it overly difficult. It's at this point not testing. It's at this point tricking or something mm -hmm. like that. Like for example, you. They, uh, I remember in my live stream years, we 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 did not have enough books, mm -hmm. and and we used the test called simulation. Mm -hmm. And the, in the book, what they do, they don't give the questions in order. Mm -hmm. You first get 28, then 25. Right. And that's not testing. That's like tricking and mm -hmm. seeing if you can um, avoid mm -hmm. traps, basically. Uh, so the, that's what the, the problem is with the third-party publisher books. Right. Uh, but to me, though, I, I've done that book myself. And I think it's, a, it's, it's actually a good form of challenge it sort of pushes the forces the odd the reader to try to keep track of everything and try to pay more attention i guess right we don't use this we don't have that on the menu here we don't teach no, simulation like, I, I don't think it's the um right way of looking at it. imagine uh -huh. you are running 100 meters versus uh -huh. you are running 400 meters uh -huh. if you are preparing for 100 meters i need to push myself to my limit and run 400 meters uh -huh. it's not the same experience at all Right. Because like the 400 meter champion, I don't, I forgot his name. Mm -hmm. Versus Usain Bolt, they come from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So if you are thinking that I need to prepare for this exam with more difficult questions, mm -hmm. because if I'm prepared for more difficult questions, then I will be finding easier questions much easier. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's not it's a flawed logic. Yeah, yeah, it's a flawed logic because then you probably uh, putting your mind to mm -hmm. thinking maybe they're trying to trick me. Mm -hmm. When you do easy question, oh, that's overly easy, right? Mm -hmm. It cannot be that easy, especially mm -hmm. with true, false, not given, mm -hmm. and yes, not given questions, you probably start thinking this mm -hmm. way. But if you do the Cambridge ones, uh, you know, they are pretty much the same, especially mm -hmm. for you know audience that's watching us. Just do Cambridge 14 to 19 at this point. Mm -hmm. Don't do the, the old ones mm -hmm. unless you run out of uh, mm -hmm. books to do practice. Mm -hmm. But 14 to 19, they are the mm -hmm. most reliable ones, I believe. Right. The, my philosophy here, though, is as long as you get the basics right, like the core skills, like reading, vocabulary, and comprehension, it makes little difference what kind of questions or what the format of the test is, right? If you're confident in your skills overall. Yeah, that's right? true. Uh, Which, if you get the vocabulary, mm -hmm. pronunciation, grammar right, mm -hmm. the three pillars of 
any mm-hmm. language, I believe, mm-hmm. right? Then you're okay. But you need to learn some, like, for example, if you and I mm-hmm. happen to take CPE, mm-hmm. I don't think we can get A's in that, mm-hmm. even with our good command of English, because you need to be trained in that for you long mm-hmm. enough, I believe, to get A's in that. Mm-hmm. It's much harder than IELTS, but we mm-hmm. are used to IELTS format. So if you and I go and take the test, I guess we can get C2, but mm-hmm. I'm not sure if we, you and I take the CPA mm-hmm. tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Just learning the the surface level understanding of the exam, mm-hmm. we can a- get A's in that exam. Right, right, yeah. In the in the in the sense uh, from the from the perspective of efficiency and effectiveness, mm-hmm. you better stick to yes. standard textbooks, yes. right? Like yes. that, like Cambridge. Yeah, the the the, the ones made yeah. by Cambridge. Yeah, that's useful piece of information. Students need to know, right? Yeah, we. Uh, I, I was going to ask you a lot of questions about IELTS, but I feel like there's already a lot of content yes, on IELTS, yes. right? So let's just yes. uh, keep that, uh, keep away from that topic. Yeah. <laughs> so instead, I want to, oh, I'm as someone who runs a school here, I would like to, you know, not just know about, also learn from your personal experience of running a school. So could you give us sort of the like sort of the walkthrough of your, of, of management, of the things you do at your own school. But, but I think we should start off with the, you know, back, back story. Like how did things come about? Like where did, thing, where did things begin? <clears throat> so I think in the age of social media, you cannot run your business without presence on social media, mm-hmm. right? So business at this point equals, success of business equals social media presence and how mm-hmm. successful you are in social media. Or so, at least how successful uh, you're perceived. Yeah, you're perceived. Yeah. No, I mean, if you are having a lot of views uh-huh. and then, like, it's all also about how you are able to convert that. Mm-hmm. Like, conversion rate is also important. Uh, but I had large enough audience who sees that uh, we are able to help students and students are happy with the fact that they chose us. And, and then that was for me, oh, okay, I think if I uh, start the school, I think there will be people coming. And so, and I was looking at the size of the channel, but I, at this time, uh, like when I started the school, um, my s- you, Telegram channel, I need to also tell you that I only am most active on Telegram. So, and then I don't have um, like what's, Instagram presence, most education centers in Tashkent. Most of the established education centers in Tashkent, they have a different way of management and different way of uh, running and different way of, I guess, thinking in in that their goal is different. I believe if you like some of the big established ones, their goal is not really to work for the result. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. At this point, if you have that many branches, your goal is... You are more. You're not really teaching at this point. You are mostly providing service, all right. And then you need to make sure that people there are just feeling good. They're taking pictures, nice facilities, and everything. Whereas in my experience, like the kinds of students who come to our education center are people who want to get scholarships or people who who want to continue their studies abroad for master's degree. And so I knew that. And for me, at the beginning, it's not that important as long as my facilities are good enough, but they don't have to be top notch. Mm-hmm. So, my like with uh, with not that investment, I started the school. So, and I also knew that I'm not competing with them uh, in their ground, in their because we're not on the same what's the word level playing field. That, that, uh-huh. That's the expression in English. Uh-huh. So, because they are more established and they're kind of people they want to appeal to are, are totally different. To the kind of people that I want to target. My goal is I want to target people who want to get IELTS exam and they are choosing universities that will give them scholarship based on IELTS. But there are not many of them, honestly. So maybe, and then at this point we have students who want to be IELTS instructors, which is one of the sad things that's mm-hmm. happening, I believe, mm-hmm. that so many people want to be IELTS instructors. Um, not that I'm afraid of competition and everything, but if I could, uh, you know, I think they could do something else, you know what I mean? So they, they, they do have interest in, in some other field mm-hmm. and maybe pursue that. That's going to be more 
impactful. Maybe it's just our own impression because we are constantly surrounded with people who want to learn English. Yeah, because that's that's, that's, that's what I used bit, to think. That's yeah, what I used to think. That's, like that's there, now that I think it's probably the kind of bias I have. Probably, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. I'm is. misjudging the situation. It probably. is. It is. Like for example, sometimes I mm -hmm. think. Girls with the name Madina and Maftuna usually beautiful. Uh huh. And then I also <laughs> realized that there are so many girls with the name Madina and Maftuna. Uh, uh, so you think all the Madinas and Maftunas must be beautiful, yeah. but then you think that no, it's not really the case. It's probably in my experience, Jasminas are, but Jasmina is not that common. I always wonder if there is a link between beauty and, uh, and a name. Uh, uh, <laughs> That's someone's gonna do study on this, okay? If you guys wondering to what to do for your dissertation, there you go. Here's your topic. So I, I probably that you know <laughs> because Madinas and Maftunas are really common names. Uh -huh. So probably you think you meet a lot of them, and then they happen. Obviously, the mm -hmm. the probability of you meeting mm -hmm. a beautiful girl with the name Maftuna and Madina is going to be higher too, probably. Yeah. Um, so yeah, probably that happened. Mm -hmm. That I'm that that I'm surrounded with the kids who want to mm -hmm. who want to pursue this line of work. Um, yeah, probably that. Yeah. But generally, yeah, that's the kind of audience we were mm -hmm. dealing with. Yeah, well, still dealing yeah. with, I believe. Yeah, I I used to think that IELTS is a big deal, learning English is a big deal, or being English teacher is a big deal. Until I started having this podcast and start talking to all these people who come from different walks of life, and there are all these universes. Like, and we're, we're all our own universe here, a community. Yes. And then there's a you know, community of engineers. There's a community of uh, guys who want to be politicians, career politicians. There's a community of people who want to get into business or sell, sell cars or trucking and medicine and everything. So, yeah, I, I just started to realize how small you are. You're not as, as big or as influential or, or as important as you thought you were. Oh, like so that's... that's I also like the look at this chair. Uh -huh. The person who made this chair, um, is he having an impact on society? Mm -hmm. Probably yes. Not as much direct impact as you and I have. Mm -hmm. So we are able to, as teachers, not as much as school teachers, but mm -hmm. school teachers can shape the kid even more profoundly, I believe. Mm -hmm. But we are also able to, if we are in the lessons, deliver lessons not by teaching them English, maybe by exposing to them to things that they would otherwise not be exposed to in terms mm. of ideas and concepts. I think they maybe, mm -hmm. maybe, I don't know, they become interested in certain things and they mm -hmm. want to learn more, they want to learn and study philosophy more. But our impact on people's lives is more direct than other people. So online I get um, some level of hate in, because they say, oh, you're just an IELTS instructor. Mm -hmm. And I don't like the fact that people say that Oh, because I chose this line of work, it mm -hmm. doesn't mean that anyone's job is more important, honestly. Mm -hmm. I think the job of a chair maker is as important as my job, or my job is as important as that of a medical professional mm -hmm. who's saving lives. Yes, it looks like that their lives, but someone needs to do it. Do it. My, my belief is that if I want to be a doctor, if I wanted to be a doctor, I could have become a doctor too, because I believe that anything is learnable. So if I want to be an engineer and then like, doing some engineering work. Yes, it's much harder. That's why not many people are becoming engineers and making that much money that engineers make. But if I put my mind to that, I can do that. I just have, like, life happened to me and I decided to do this line of work mm -hmm. at this time of my life. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe that everybody's, like, job is as important, but it depends on how direct or indirect the impact is, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, but we are also in a good position because when people are choosing jobs, they, I'm, I'm not sure how often people consider the kind of impact they have on society mm -hmm. because that's like really important. Like, because everybody says that three things in life are most important, the who are you living with, where you live and the kind of job you have, right? So when you are choosing your job, are you also considering whether you have an impact on society? Um, in my head, I was thinking this, I believe. No, really? Yes. It was one of the things yes, that crossed your things. mind. Yes. I was like, me as mm -hmm. a truck driver, mm -hmm. I am, I'm, yes, I'm delivering food for people, especially like it's mm -hmm. important delivering food, delivering. It's not just food. You are delivering something from A to B, right? But it's not the same level of impact that you could have on somebody's life as, as a teacher. Like, for, for example, me as a truck driver, 
probably I would make more money than a, a, me as an IELTS instructor. Mm -hmm. Because nobody, maybe things are a little bit different in Uzbekistan. Nobody in the world goes into teaching thinking that I'm going to make a lot of money. Because mm -hmm. teaching is one of the most underpaid jobs, right? Mm -hmm. So I think most teachers are going into teaching because they want to have a positive impact on somebody's life. Mm -hmm. And I also realized that my teaching is different to normal teaching. That's, mm -hmm. that's a very narrow field of teaching, which mm -hmm. is IELTS, standardized teaching. And also, if you think about, think about it, teaching is a lot less stressful than other jobs. Yes. Because you're working with kids who are so suggestible and listen to you. Yeah. But in the real world, though, with adults, you're, you often have conflicts. You, everyone has got, has got their own agenda. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got their own ego. way of doing ego and all all that all that. I used to think teaching is is really stressful. Now that I talk to these guys who have jobs in the adult world, yes, right. Where I I just started to realize that it's something you can do in your in your sleep. Because with yeah. kids, uh, they they usually follow your lead. At least they listen to you, right? There is someone guiding, someone in charge. I guess it it does apply to some extent in the adult world too, but things are more chaotic, a lot more chaotic uh, in the grown up world. Yes. So, and that's probably one of the reasons why people might go into teaching because it's safer and because it's uh, less confrontational, because there's not much uh, stress involved. Also, the kind of teaching we are engaged in, uh -huh. I'm sorry, is uh -huh. different to. The teaching you do in a public school, mm -hmm. I think if you are a teacher in a public school, especially teaching elementary level or middle schoolers, I think that's a lot more stressful. Mm -hmm. um, I believe I have one or two friends who went to, into teaching in, in that type of school. And kids um, these days are wild, I believe. You know what I mean? They they, they got all got phones. Mm -hmm. I, know, I think you, it also depends on you, how you're able to manage the class. But if you're mm -hmm. one of those people who cannot manage the class... I think they'll just give you a very hard time. Yeah. They'll give you a very hard time. It's really going to be stressful. Mm -hmm. Plus a lot of paperwork, plus a lot of tasks that you are supposed to do. That's not part of your job description. And I think it could be a lot more stressful than the kind of teaching you, are in, you and I engaged in, mm -hmm. luckily, I guess. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah. For sure, for sure. All right. and, and I think we should circle back to your... To, to your description, your account of running your own school. Right? Yes. Starting out, what was your philosophy founding the school? What was your mission? What was the, like the mission you set yourself? Or did you have any? Yeah, I, yeah, that's a good question. Did I have a mission? Um, I was actually asked this question if I have a mission in my life um, by the parent of, um, of a girl that I was going to marry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, that question was a very big question. Like, do I have a mission in life? I said, no. And the, the parent said, the father said, you're not ready for that. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's, that's not true. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think like, you know, you need to have a mission to do something. Maybe to me, that sounds a little bit too big, but mm -hmm. my goal was the way I learned English is by exposing myself to English as much as possible. Right? Mm -hmm. That's pretty much how everybody learns. Like, um, I like, if I watch a lot of content in Russian for like good six or seven month, I believe I my Russian level goes to decent level. Mm -hmm. And I read a lot as well. And I thought if we teach English, we do that. All right. We teach English with immersion. No, um, we don't go around saying that we have a cool app. We don't go around saying that we have the methods brought from England or from, mm -hmm. from Australia or mm -hmm. from Finland or that kind of nonsense. Um, we just say, okay, everybody learns English the same way and we're going to uh, tailor that kind of you know, educational material to you as well. I'm going to create that. So we do have, starting from pre-intermediate level, um, anime as part, of the, wow. as part of the curriculum. So they start, the, the pre-intermediate level lasts 36 uh, lessons. Mm -hmm. So there, there are 36 episodes they need to watch and there are exercises they do as part of. And we also tell the child or the learner that that's not enough. You need to expose mm -hmm. yourself to English to as mm -hmm. much as possible. We do the, the main course book material, but also a bit of translation as well. I think translation for some reason is, um, has got bad rap, basically, mm -hmm. bad reputation. Mm -hmm. well, translation is boring and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But I believe lots of uh, polyglots, famous polyglots like Luca Lamparello, they learn languages, they learn languages with translation. 
There is another uh, Slovakian guy. He also mainly learns with translation. Mm -hmm. We basically, I decided, okay, if we are teaching English, um, we need to do two things, immersion and lots of translation. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thinking. And when it comes to IELTS, and I know what mm -hmm. to do. Like pretty much this is my forte basically, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So I like, I know what to do in terms of IELTS, but when mm -hmm. it comes to language instruction, we don't go around mm -hmm. uh, spreading nonsense that we have some uh, you know, unique method. I just, we do two things that everybody pretty much picks up the language with immersion and we add a bit of, you know, our own thing, which is translation, mm -hmm. you know, pretty much that the whole world has done for many, many years. For some reason, it got bad reputation lately, mm -hmm. but yeah, we are giving it a go. Yes. I mean, I'm still processing uh, the fact that this guy teaches students English by getting them to watch anime. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still thinking about that, guys. If you if you want to learn English the fun way, go to DR Bank Isles, yes. <laughs> and you're watching anime all day. Long. I believe lots of kids nowadays are so into anime. Uh -huh. So, but in the in a higher level, we know mm -hmm. the kind of people in their age and their background. Mm -hmm. So we change it to Office, the mm -hmm. uh, the sitcom episodes. Mm -hmm. There are 36 episodes chosen from Office. Right. So it's upper intermediate level. Intermediate level, different mm -hmm. one. So we chose different things. So we do something similar in the you know, way of immersion, but not exactly get them to watch uh, TV shows or anime, which actually help a lot, a big deal. But rather we get them to watch content on YouTube on various topics. Yes. So they're more flexible. Yeah, so, basically the same. Mm -hmm. You give the kid input. Mm -hmm. And then output. Mm -hmm. So input, output. The like, yeah. I guess if you do coding, the same thing. You yeah. you co write a code, and then you're gonna mm -hmm. have output. The, the same is in language mm -hmm. uh, instruction and learning as well. So you give the kid input, and you make sure that they're able to recycle it, and then yeah. use it, and then you, they will be able able to make you know output. Yeah, 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 yeah. For yes. sure, for sure. Well, what I was just trying to say is just we try to vary our content to include uh, a little bit of science, a little bit of uh, comedy, a little bit of TV shows, uh, environment, and everything. So yeah. they are more flexible in, in their ability to produce language. They can talk about many different topics, yes. right? I used to be a, a crazy anime and movie fan, fan too. What's your favorite anime? <laughs> Don't, is it Death Note that everybody talks about? Yes. Oh, oh come Death on, Note. Come on. I, I, yes. It's hard to beat. Yes. <laughs> everybody says that it's the, because my brother watched anime and I'm uh -huh. not the biggest anime fan, uh -huh. but my friend who watched a lot of anime tell, tells me that you need to watch Death Note and there's another one, Brotherhood or something like that. Uh, you ha first watch Death Note and then watch whatever you want, but you uh, gotta watch Death Note first. Uh, I, right. I watched that show over and over again, probably, I don't know, like six, ten times and I still don't get enough of it. Mm. I, I, It's so thought-provoking in a way that makes you wonder how how elaborate the way things are set up and and how forward thinking the writer is and how how unexpected things are in the way they unfold mm. it's so shockingly good and phenomenal that there are moments there were moments i literally got off my seat and be holding my head how is that even possible? Wow. And, and that so I got to give it a watch. That takes, yes. that takes a lot of skill to get that sort of reaction it, out of your audience. Is it Americans making it or is it Japanese it's people? Ja all, all anime yeah. is Japanese. All, all, all anime. 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 But they made Netflix version of that anime and they ruined it. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. And people are people not liking it. People don't like it. Yeah. Mm. You, should, you should check out the anime version Did they in English. like tone it down to mm -hmm. satisfy American... Uh, taste. <laughs> I, I just read the reviews. We didn't watch the movie yeah, early. Okay. So, but it's totally worth a watch. The actual anime, the real anime. Okay. Right. And uh, back to your school. So uh, you did talk about your curriculum. I wonder how you go about your staff recruitment and training. So what are the criteria you have for someone who would like to work at DR Beck Isles, say if you, they want to join your team? Well, if they, like it depends on like, is it general English instruction? Uh -huh. Then we want someone with English teaching background. So they need to uh -huh. have a degree in English mm -hmm. literature and mm -hmm. English teaching, right? ELT. Um, it could be like someone with a CELTA degree. It uh -huh. could be someone with TESOL degree, uh -huh. you know? So it doesn't matter. 
But if, if someone wants to teach IELTS, mm -hmm. because I believe these are two separate things, teaching mm -hmm. IELTS and teaching English are two separate things, and they need to definitely have at least 8.5 mm -hmm. for, for them to be able to, and at least 7.5 in writing as well. Wow. So, yes. Standards uh, are pretty high over there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like here, the, 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 the requirement we have for our teachers for our recruits is 8. 8.5. But we, we, we wish to up the bar here, but we simply don't have the, the teacher pool, enough pool, big enough pool here to select, to choose from. Yeah, I wonder how things change now that the new branch is mm -hmm. also opening, because um, I do know who, who are the people joining us, and they already have 8.5, like the ones that are teaching mm -hmm. uh, IELTS, but the ones that are teaching mm -hmm. English, they need to have that, that kind of background. Mm -hmm. Because lately, I made a post saying that CELTA degree is unnecessary if you want to teach IELTS. Mm -hmm. And that was somehow controversial. Mm -hmm. Because my thinking is that if you are teaching English, yes, you need to, maybe there are things that you do get from one month of CELTA training. But if you are an IELTS instructor, I don't think you really need CELTA training, I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Because IELTS, uh, IELTS, is, IELTS teaching is different to, I believe, English teaching. So that's why when we are hiring, we, you know, separate that. We have separate categories. Mm -hmm. So that, in terms of recruitment, um, in terms of how the decision making happens, um, I'm, I'm, because I'm involved in teaching myself, I'm not really part of the management. There are people who manage uh, the place. Mm -hmm. uh, one is my brother. One is um, another person. Uh, who's capable of doing that and it's not it's not like we are that big to have so many managers at so many levels you mm -hmm. know i know in some education centers they have manager over manager like middle uh, management yes, yes. junior it's management. micromanagement which i really right. hate um i, I believe um I, I do. I don't think that you should be micromanaging people. I guess people have the brains mm -hmm. <laughs> to to mm -hmm. do things with their common sense. Right. So there are a few like important tasks that, that everyone has, mm -hmm. and then everyone does their work, and like, it's completely um, you know I guess okay thing to mm -hmm. expect from people. Like okay, you have these tasks; these are main tasks, mm -hmm. and I'm not asking anything out of your job description if you do these things. And I think we as a as a school, mm -hmm. um, function efficiently, I believe. Then, then that's why I also, like I said earlier at the podcast, me going into this uh, new landscape, terrain, uh, could be a lot more different than I expect it to be. And mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I guess I'm okay with that. And I'm expecting that things will be slightly different mm -hmm. that now that we are, we've expanded. Right, right. And what are some qualities you look for in a good teacher? What are some qualities that yeah. I look for in a good teacher? What would you expect them to have? What kind of attributes you would expect them to have? First of all, they need to know what they are mm -hmm. doing. They mm -hmm. obviously be competent. Mm -hmm. Be competent, number one thing. Uh, if you don't, if you are not competent, if you are, then it's not going to work out. Uh, another thing is you need to really care about the future of these people. All right. So if you are doing this job. Is a way to make money only, right? Like, is it not make a lot of money in that sense? Just to, to bring food to the table. That that's it. But you don't really care about the future of a kid. You're not really caring about that. It's not good. You need to really be, you know, ex like talking about that kind of thing. Impact, meaning thing. Mm -hmm. All right, what I'm doing is meaningful. They need to know that. If you, I think my job as a manager is also to to give everybody a task. And then they think that this task is meaningful. If they know that, like, for example, if I'm telling the reception uh, person, okay, give me the list of people who came this week and whether they are still continuing with us. And I'm going to do this with that list. And I give clear instructions to her because she knows rather than give me the list, right? Rather than th this command is different from me telling the meaning behind this, their task. I think they're going to do it with a lot more care mm -hmm. and they know that, that what they're doing is meaningful and they're going to probably do it more efficiently and faster. So I, I, I want to have people working with me who think that what they're doing is meaningful and impactful. So hopefully if, if these two qualities are uh, you know, in check, uh, probably, yeah, off the top of my head, these are the two things that I uh, look for in a teacher. Mm -hmm. All right. How would you rate yourself as a teacher on a scale zero to 10? Like I got a, I got a comment saying that your lessons are very teacher focused. Uh -huh. um, and, um, 
and then that's coming from a student who attended my lessons in 2019, uh, right? So, um, and then, and I didn't respond to that, um, and I was like, okay, whatever. But I would say probably I'm I'm a good eight. Mm-hmm. I'm a good eight probably now that I've upped my teaching um, in the classroom, the way mm-hmm. I improvise, the way I talk to students, the way I care about everyone. Mm-hmm. I just don't want to deal with the people who are raising hands only. You know, I, mm-hmm. I know uh, that there's there's a shy kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I try to, I have self-awareness in me mm-hmm. and I, I know that um, uh, there are moments that I am probably going off at a tangent because I do have that tendency mm-hmm. uh, and then I can easily digress. So I, I, I'm always watching myself and what I'm doing in the classroom and I try to you know circle myself back to what I was doing. But generally, I think I am now a lot more interactive in the way I deliver lessons. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm probably a good eight. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, like in terms of all aspects so and I also just want to um, keep telling myself that I'm an IELTS instructor versus mm-hmm. an English teacher IELTS mm-hmm. instructors job I believe is a lot easier than than an English teacher mm-hmm. <laughs> honestly yeah yes yeah hundred percent well eight eight sounds like a good good score right eight yes. number to aspire to yes. yeah and how would you define yourself as a leader Right. As someone who leads a staff of, I don't know, 10, 20, mm. 15, uh, 30 people. So let's talk a little about leadership, too. Um, yeah, leadership. Um, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I don't think it's common. Um, it's, not, it's not really common for me to look at myself. I don't look at myself as a leader mm-hmm. in that sense. I, like, I do manage in people. Um, but I, w- I would say I'm, I, c- I try to care about people. I realized that I also remember my experience, my background, um, me coming from teacher background, then running school versus someone being a business person, then running management, mm-hmm. like doing management are totally diff- different things. I know the kind of uh, background I come from. I come from, I am what they call um, teacher turned uh, school runner basically mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. and so for, f- that's why I try to be as caring as possible I know where they're coming from what kind of things because I pretty much experienced the same things as a teacher myself mm-hmm. and they, what they expect from a person who's running the school so um, yeah I try to like if I'm giving somebody a task I know that I need to s- set a set a model basically be like okay if I am telling my teacher one of my teachers don't come late and I should not come late as well, right? If I'm telling them not to cancel less, and I should not cancel less and put somebody uh, in my re- as a replacement. So I try to be that. Maybe not always successfully, but if I am do- doing that, I guess you know others will be like, okay, so he's he as mm-hmm. a as a person who's running this place, mm-hmm. um, you know. So you try to practice what you preach. Yes, basically, right. I'm not because in this country. I believe I've never seen a good leader. I believe mm-hmm. um, because in the because we learn English, leadership in America is a little bit different. I believe you know so, someone who usually is a leader, let, let it be company um, CEO, let it be president, let, let it be a pol- politician. They have what they call gift of the gap. I guess they they know how to speak right. But here, people don't know how to speak, I believe. You, like you ask the average person, you watch one of those YouTube videos where you ask an old man, like, what kind of piece of advice would you give to someone, um, you know, who's 20-year-old or to, to your 20-year-old self? They give really meaningful advice. I don't think people in our country, most people, I mean, don't know how to speak. All right? So in my head, leader is someone who's managing a very big place. And also, we in our society, being able to talk... Uh, and then the kind of talk they appreciate is different because if you look at people who are make, who are successful on social media and they are talking they hear talk very generally no specific things oh you need to be a good person and that kind of things like you cannot disagree with any of those things because what they are saying is totally general things very general things that nobody would disagree with and they come out and tell again that that's different um, so that's why I don't really um, I know there are people like Simon Sinek and t- talking about leadership and stuff because for me, I know people go into management degree, they do management courses to be able to manage those big things, right? Like big companies like, um, for example, imagine managing um, Karzinka. 
So the current manager of Karzinka, as far as I know, is an Englishman wow. who makes what I from what I heard, hundred thousand dollars per month. Mm-hmm. All right. So you are managing a, a big supermarket ch- chain in one of the biggest countries in Central Asia, the biggest country, not one of the biggest countries in Central Asia. And you need to have a lot of experience. I think that's leadership. That's a lot of decision making. But in my experience, like the kind of decisions they make don't compare to the kinds of the decision, decisions they make. Like, right? Like, for example, they do totally different things. And our the scale of decision making is nowhere comparable to theirs. Mm-hmm. So I, I know that. Um, so, so, yeah, but in my experience with the small size we have, I try to be as caring as possible and set an example. These are two things. Right. Wow. Uh, so we were speaking, we were talking about leaders, right? Do you have any leader you look up to that you admire? Do I have a leader that mm-hmm. I look up that to? That you would model yourself after, you'd model your kids after? No, I don't think mm-hmm. so. Mm-hmm. Um, because I believe uh, when you... It's always you and your experience, I believe. It's totally different. Mm. Um, there's no point. Maybe some people say that. I know there are people online who make, okay, I want to try out Da Vinci's 30, like daily life, right? And there's Benjamin Franklin's, I th- saw because Benjamin Franklin wrote a very famous uh, autobiography. And so the logic is that, so these people led very successful lives. And what if I copy their lives and then try to replicate them, basically? And can I replicate the results, too? I don't think it really works out. So in my experience, it's always my experience. And I need to try to do things the, the way I want to do. Mm-hmm. I know that most of the things that I think I think are my own are mm-hmm. not really my thinking. Because it's society and my parents, all of that, all of these factors, all of these parties put their thinking into my head. Mm-hmm. But I try to detach from that and try to really understand what is it that I want. And I, I, I try to be as me as possible, maybe not always successfully, but I think when it comes to parenting, when it comes to any aspect that you're uh, focusing on, uh, I think I, I try to just see what, what, what I do, if I do things things certain way, um, maybe they will work out just fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not one of those people, for example, um, who has certain person as their role model? I think there, there's no one literally you can um, you, you can respect as being flawless. They all mm. have their imperfections, but the the way they're perceived might be flawless. But nobody is essentially flawless. So I just try to have my own experience and mm-hmm. then try to um, formulate my own thinking, my mm-hmm. um, my lifestyle in the way I want to design my own lifestyle. Funnily enough, apparently there are people who design life for you. Oh, they are called life coaches, and they are, they make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. All right, so they make as much as seven hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, they they, they make a mm-hmm. lot of money. So I, I don't I don't I don't think I need a life coach um, who who you talk to to make decisions. So there's no literally a person that I would look up to and then say that person is my role model, because um, as a kid you might have a role model, right? So that's the person I admire. I wish I was like my teacher. You will be like because there's always one teacher who impresses you. You're like, I wish I was like him. I wish I was as smart, as knowledgeable. But as you grow up, you realize it's like one of those. One of the, there is a funny poem. Oh, where the kid sees their teacher shopping, right? Grocery shopping. So it's a not a very like it's a funny thing, right? We see our teacher and then get excited, and that the teacher that you admire in school. It's just a normal person you realize as you get older. So I think there's literally no one that I look up to and admire mm-hmm. so much so that I want to mm-hmm. uh, design my my life using their basically imprint. Mm-hmm. So there's no right. there's no such thing as. There is actually a quote that really, really puts that what you just said into in one clear frame for people to understand. It's. And the quote goes, don't follow someone's path, make your own trail. Oh, okay. Right, right. And, uh, but, but the reason why not everyone might like this idea is because making your own trail is, sounds very risky. Yes. Sounds very risky. What if you go wrong, right? Right. And There's a 
Frank Sinatra song. Mm -hmm. uh, at least I did it my own way. Like mm -hmm. there is a song. Uh, oh yeah. I yes. I believe <laughs> um, the most of the time as a teenager, for example, you think the kind of problems you are experiencing are unique to me. Uh -huh. But when in fact everybody has gone through the same, you know, teenager problems basically. Mm -hmm. Um, then as a, as an adult, you think, oh, do I ha do I have an original thought? Like, mm -hmm. um, no, I think all the thoughts that you think you have, mm -hmm. which are original, mm -hmm. have been have been thought. Mm -hmm. All right, it's like um, in the field of epistemology, like like mm -hmm. no knowledge, right? What is first of all what constitutes knowledge, and can we generate new knowledge? Right. So like uh, as people like David Deutsch, I believe. They talk about like the, the he. I didn't read the book. I just read short form version of one page summary of it. Mm -hmm. um, like if I think that if if there is a book that goes viral, and I simply check the one page summary of the book from book uh, short form. There's a website called Short Form, um, and they they I I'm not subscribed to it because it's quite expensive. I'm not reading um, a lot of books, so I was like, okay. But if there is a book that everyone is hyping up, hyped up. And I'll definitely check that. And there he's, he's written a book called The Beginning of Infinity. Mm -hmm. All right. In the book, he mainly talks about creating new knowledge, how everyone can create new knowledge. All right. And but in my head, like it's never that it's always um, you might think you are creating new knowledge, but it's always built up on the collective experience of the humankind that has lived so far. And mm -hmm. I think he definitely he talks about and acknowledged and realized that. Right. He recognized that, obviously, in his book. But for me to um, ex to be able to do that, I think I need to engage in a different kind of uh, field. Like, for example, I think, can I um, engage in that and then generate new knowledge? Uh, for example, it's, it's very specific, domain-specific, I believe. For example, if you're a physicist, can you generate new knowledge in the field of physics, phys physics for example? But when it comes to general uh, life, uh, like for example, oh, like in terms of what life coaches do, uh, I, I, I don't think that could be considered new knowledge. Um, what, what I think is new knowledge is like that can be generated in those kinds of fields like chemistry and mm -hmm. et cetera. Like that's why they generate something new. Mm -hmm. that it's so impactful that they get recognized by different organizations like Nobel and, mm -hmm. and those kinds of, or, um, you know, rewards, I believe. Here's my take on new knowledge and where thought, yes. thoughts originate. I was, I was actually talking about my theory. I have a theory about where thoughts come from, where thoughts originate. But people, if I share this, this right now, people might think I'm crazy, but <laughs> I'm going to do mm -hmm. it anyway. So I think knowledge thoughts are in the air mm -hmm. and then and that we are like receptors i what i think what i feel like based on the all the reading and the learning my own personal research i've done on the internet which is not scientific <laughs> yes uh, we're thoughts are born in a different dimension that mm -hmm. is not three-dimensional it's like fourth fifth dimensional and that and they're traveling in air just as uh, electricity or just as uh, particles travel in, in air. And they enter this world through us. Mm -hmm. And then so that, that thought, some people call it inspiration, right? Only enters through you if you are ready for it or open. Mm -hmm. Like if you think about open-minded people tend to have more original thoughts and... Uh, ideas and more innovative than close-minded people. Yes. So w what I think is if you're open-minded enough and that you're paying attention, right, that that thought comes through you and you become the vessel mm -hmm. from that dimension. Then you generate new right, knowledge. Right, right, right. And, and, and if you choose, if you reject that thought or that information that's come, that's supposed to come into this world, right, and there's time for it and there's place for it, and you reject it, it's going to go into someone else. And I actually have personal experience illustrating it. What's and experience? it's so mind-blowing. Mind so, you know, my last attempt, I got nine overall, my third nine. 
I was actually going. I was. I was actually going after quadruple nines. I was. Mm. I, I want to get perfect nine, yes. right? And I. I was on the test. And I felt that day I was gonna get it. I, you know it. You, yes. You know the feeling, right? Yes. So everything's going perfect, right? Listening, all correct. Reading, all, all correct. And not you know. I, I don't even need checking. Like you're so you're confident in your results, right? And. And then you do something wrong, and I did. I think I, I did something that I wasn't supposed to do, so, somewhat dishonest, and it sort of messed up with my energy. Mm. And and that moment, things start going south. And I feel like that moment, sort of the channel closed. That thing that nine was, overall, yeah. <laughs> that was supposed to enter this world <laughs> through <laughs> my vessel, <laughs> that, that door was shut. Were you not open to that experience? What no, happened? No, I, I, so you see, the humans, we have, we, we have different frequencies, vibrations. Yes. Like we call it the vibes, all right? Yes. And, and I was vibrating at the frequency that allowed that thought or that invention or that new thing to come to, into this world through me. I had that vibration, but because I did something this genuine, this, this somewhat dishonest, it, my vibrations changed mm. the frequency, and that and that ch- portal was closed. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you understand. Yes. And here's the that's not the crazy. The crazy part is, so the test is over. I I was satisfied. I knew I was gonna get a nine, but not a, not Quite portable a nine, right? right? Not the perfect nine, right? And then my results come out on Tuesday. And I see. So overall nine, but writing eight, right? Not portable nine. Week. After that event, literally, a guy from Navai gets nine in writing. Oh. I don't think that's a co- coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's a coincidence. I don't think that's a coincidence. So you closed the portal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, and opened it for him, probably. No, I mean, I, I don't know how this portal thing works. Yes. <laughs> but I've had uh, so many instances in the past where I feel like this theory is not just a theory. Right. Yeah, someone, I think it's someone a popular asked it. theory. It's like, uh, like the the vibration thing you're talking about, how the uh-huh. universe responds, and then uh-huh. yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have one or two friends who who believe it's in that, in the same theory. Yeah. Um, do and, I do I think the same? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't. Yeah. I don't think I have given enough thought to that. Yeah. It's, it's, so what I'm trying to say here is, if you're open minded enough, and that you're just uh, do play your part, be where you're supposed to be and do the things you're supposed to be doing, your responsibilities, you naturally start getting inspiration from all these different directions mm. uh, as opposed to following what other people are doing or follow, doing what society expects you to do. You just vibrate at your own frequency. You become vessel to all those new thoughts mm. that enter, that start <clears throat> entering this universe, this dimension from that dimension through you. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, there is theological explanation to it. There is scientific ex- explanation to it. I'm not sure how much science there is, but uh, I'd like to think that there is some truth to it. And that's why I'm doing s- everything I do or every thought I, I have or every habit I develop, I make sure it doesn't mess with my vibration because I want to s- mm. still have that access mm. to, that, <laughs> to that universe. <laughs> I don't want to be cut off. Yes. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why I'm, uh, so open-handed with uh, all the things I've been given, all the knowledge, the insights, the experience I learned and share, shared public, publicly. Never worry about people turning it into a course or uh, you know someone is uh, running to a different school and start yes. this idea because I I I feel like like I'm I'm just a vessel here, mm. right, right. I, I stop being generous. I stop being uh, handing the things that I'm being handed to other people. I won't be given. I won't be receiving anymore. Mm. So th- that's my thinking here, right? I like, do you think when you do that, you are selfish? Uh, when I keep those things to me? No, because you are saying. Oh yeah, in yes. a sense, that, that's um, actually a very selfish thing to do. <laughs> but because I want, I want to keep yes, getting that receiving reward. The, yes, because I want to keep receiving that reward. That is very selfish if you think about it. But yeah. I think it's a win-win. Here's what I yeah. think. It's a win-win because someone has to be that vessel anyway. So I'd yes. say, why not me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I actually opened up about this to one of my staff staff teachers here. And it was sometime 10, 11, and we were having one of those therapy sessions, yes. right? Heart to heart conversations. And yes. she sat there and she was listening to me. And and she 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 had that look on her face like is everything okay with this guy? <laughs> All right, th- this guy's working too much. And, yes. and, and she was like, well, that's called experience, don't you think? Yeah. There's, <laughs> that was, no, that there's was a word for that. that, that there's <laughs> a word for that. That was literally her experience, mm-hmm. her, her reaction to what I said. And yeah, anyway, it's just wild. It's just wild. So back to leadership and conversation we were having about running your own place. I think... Um, nearly done with that chapter but one more question i want to ask you before we move on to the next part of the uh, podcast is what are some important lessons you learned from your experience of running your own place um it's not easy yeah Uh, one of the things that i learned is that doing anything good is not easy Mm -hmm. so like out like for example some of the schools they might get bad rep Think, um, you know, people say that, oh, they just have the nicest facilities and that's why they are just mm. successful. But even doing that is not easy. So doing anything good is not easy. So I just have learned to appreciate uh, what people are doing nicely. And I know what it takes to um, to make it successful. Like, so I'm now, I'm, I'm now appreciative of people's, uh, you know, efforts. I will be like, okay, so if you're if you're making it work the way you are making it work, good. And I, I've learned that. So I, I, I thought you, unless you do things, unless you experience it yourself, that remains a mystery to you. And then th- that remains a chapter to you that you think you know, but you actually don't know. Mm-hmm. So uh, like the, the practice of doing something is actually different to the kinds of expectations you, you have about the thing. So, yeah, and I also learned the importance of doing things, just uh, like unless you do things, like, like for example, me um, reading a book about how to ri- ri- like drive a car versus me driving a car mm-hmm. are totally different experiences. And I always tell that in the classroom. So you reading somebody's essays is never comparable to you actually writing it. Mm-hmm. So that's not to downplay the importance of reading essays, but those are two different kinds of experiences. So, and I once posted about that too on the channel about how Sufis have shown that there are three levels of understanding of things. Mm-hmm. And the Sufis, um, uh, Tasavvuf people apparently said... Sufi, what's a Sufi? Sufi is um, s- someone who's following Tasavvuf. Uh, it's a mi- mysticism. Uh-huh. Uh, mysticism. So, right. um, um, like they said, like I've heard the first level of understanding... I've heard that fire burns, uh, and like right. I've heard. I've been told by good people that fire burns, mm-hmm. and the second one is that I know somebody or something like that. And the third one is I've been burned in fire. I've been burned in fire. You knowing that fire burns you, mm-hmm. like you know that, is different to you being burned in the fire. Mm-hmm. So that explains the importance of doing things. Mm-hmm. All right. So f- from this experience, I think I learned the fact that um, you doing anything is difficult. So I'm I'm appreciative. I, like I appreciate people who are putting an effort and they are you know seeing the results of that. I will be like, okay, you guys are great. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like maybe some people are doing it the way I, that I think is dubious mm-hmm. or the wrong way. Um, <laughs> Honestly, yeah. uh, so maybe that, but still mm-hmm. I will be like, okay, you guys, at least you're making it work. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's what I've learned. Like, I think the main thing is just doing things and then doing, doing anything good is not easy. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. But it can, it can also be a lot of fun, right? It it's, can also be a lot of fun. Yes, it is a lot of fun. I mean, it is a lot of fun. So um, if you don't do anything like for three days and you just lie and mm-hmm. do nothing, it's like it's not uh, mm-hmm. ever interesting. So um, I, I don't think anyone, mm-hmm. anyone can be in some beach right now mm-hmm. and then you leave them with all the food and all, all the stuff. Mm-hmm. They, will, they will eventually get bored. Mm-hmm. And that's definitely true. So at least I'm happy that I have got, I've got a job mm-hmm. and I'm able to do things. Um, right. Yeah, having a job is good. Having a job is good. Yeah, it is, for <laughs> yeah, sure. It is, yeah. For sure. 
So at least like you'll be like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm a job. I have this job. And people like, for example, when the traffic warden, when mm-hmm. I'm the, um, driving a car and then they ask what profession you have, what, what do you do? Mm-hmm. What do you do for a living? Right. I'm a teacher. Mm-hmm. And they'll look at the other and like, okay, you're a teacher. I, 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 they will be basically looking with a pity look, you know, okay, you're a teacher, you're poor, you know what I mm-hmm. mean? So usually they go easy on you because you're mm-hmm. a teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but at least I think having a job is good. And I like to think that at this point that I like, I really like this job at this point. Like mm. you know, I get I the kinds of conversations, the kinds of relationships you make with people is like the really good part. Like for mm. example, um, with one of my students, Muhammad Sayed, he, he saw uh, what happened in Kyrgyzstan to Uzbek people with his eyes, and he told me the experience. His he, how they, his family moved to Russia and all that kind of stuff. We are so close that, and this I think the 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 job that I have currently allows me to meet people from all backgrounds and from all walks of life. And, mm-hmm. and I can make genuine relationships with them. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that has ta- taught me a lot, like, you know, learning people's experience and generally meeting a lot of people, it's generally a nice job. Um, and, um, yeah, I learned these kinds of things. Yeah. It's, it's like playing a video game, right? I sometimes feel that way. Mm. Coming, coming to work and on my character, I get to go on different missions, talk to different people, solve different problems. Yeah, and, problem. and you like the it, it, and you get rewarded for playing this game. I yes. mean, <laughs> at the same time, yeah. Yes. Um, both, both in terms of mon- uh, like compensation, in terms of money, in the form of money, but also like when a student comes with a parent and says, mm-hmm. "Okay, thank you guys, mm-hmm. you guys, that, that that that's indeed rewarding." Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Right. We did quite a lot of talking about uh, your profession, your background, your university life, your travel experience. And what do you say we uh, talk a little about your hobbies as well? Okay, this is the part where I'll I'll try to keep it short. I know you're, I think. uh, So like I was mm -hmm. saying, I don't want to like, but uh, you guys put time, like what what do you call? Timestamps. Timestamps, they're called, right? Timestamps. But generally in my experience, Mm -hmm. for, for example, when I watch Uzbek, podcasts mm-hmm. like there, there's one or two that i watch i watch mm-hmm. a podcast called Krultoy. Mm-hmm. so they talk about history mm-hmm. um and i'm never listening to it in one go unless mm-hmm. it's very interesting if it's mm-hmm. too long mm-hmm. i'm not listening to that mm-hmm. uh, even if it's uzbek if mm-hmm. it's even if it's in uzbek um if it's in english um i'm just watching the joe rogan i just mm-hmm. go to the highlights honestly mm-hmm. so i just you you told you told me that w- the, what we do we put the timestamps so mm-hmm. you just that don't worry about it being too long, overly mm-hmm. long. But yeah, like when I was telling you, can we make it shorter so that people watch the whole thing? Mm-hmm. And, and I thought it would also help with the, with the video becoming more viral. Because mm-hmm. if everybody watched in its entirety, it's a good thing for the algorithm, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. So algorithm says, okay, everybody's watching in full. Let's make it show mm-hmm. up in everyone's feed. Yeah. Um, so that's what I was thinking, yeah. I mean, yeah, sure, sure, yes. sure. So but we can talk uh, a little uh, about the, the hobbies part, yeah, right? Sure. Yeah, sure. But, but a quick disclaimer here, though. I This podcast is more for me than the audience. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm just doing it for the sake of it. Yeah, okay. and, and that's the charm of this podcast. There, there's no pressure. There's no expectations. If people watch it, they watch it. If they don't watch it, who cares? Yeah. Right? It takes so much pressure off my chest. So I don't have to worry about getting more views or making more viral content so that we can have more, you know, genuine conversation. Yes. Right? Things not being pushed or forced it just comes out natural. Yeah, of course. I mean, sincerity. Yeah, yeah it's, sincerity. it's really important. Yeah. So I honestly I couldn't care less if this podcast got only one view. Yeah. True. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, the, the hobbies, I found out that you are a bit of a gym rat. Would you, um, would you like to get into that? <laughs> yes. It's not like, for, for example, I've been this year to the gym very mm-hmm. on and off, like, you know, manner. Mm-hmm. Um, because what happened, I, I've always told this to my, told this to my brothers as well. Mm-hmm. My brother is like from a calisthenic background. Uh-huh. He's been doing calisthenic for like three or four years at this oh, point. Uh, right? I, I, I he's, respect. He's, yes. Calisthenics is way harder than lifting He's weights. now mixing it with um, li- w- lifting as well. Uh-huh. He's in much better shape than I am mm-hmm. right now. Um, but I tell my younger brother that if there is one habit that I think I should have formed much earlier, and that's lifting in the gym. Mm-hmm. 
So because how it elevates your mood and all the benefits, all the health benefits. Um, but I think what you, when you go to the gym, it's like you you feel much better than you lying in your bed and then starting your day. But if you go to the gym and you start day, your day with a gym session, and then you, you feel like you feel much more productive at the same time, you feel better, actually feel better. It's not just the words, you actually feel better. And from that point of view, I think the, the benefits you get in terms of looking better, um, you know, your muscles are bigger and that, mm -hmm. all of that is good. But mm -hmm. uh, I think I started feeling better after going to the gym. But I was so into that after I started, I, I think I started at the age of 24, mm -hmm. right? A little bit too late. Uh, a little bit late, I believe, not too late. Um, but I think I, if I started it much earlier, it would have been much better. Um, and then I went to the gym nonstop for, for a year. I was in much better shape than I started. Uh, but somehow then I changed my gym and then work got in the way. And I, so far for the past year and a half, um, mm -hmm. I think it's been very irregular. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yes, but I still, um, and I, uh, I guess my ha bad habits also getting in the way because I sleep too late. I go around eating junk food mm -hmm. and, and then I go dieting at, at this point I'm yo-yo dieting. <laughs> what's right? so, that? What's yes, that? Yes. It's like yo -yo I lose diet. weight. Uh -huh. And then I gain weight again. Uh -huh. It's like I look at my skin, what's happening to my mm -hmm. skin, you know, because I'm eating that garbage food and mm -hmm. garbage drinks. And then, then I okay, I need to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. And then and that comes down to my discipline issue. Mm -hmm. But generally, um, I think gym is one of the best places. So now we are trying to with my brother because I go to the gym with my brother. We are trying to uh, add a little bit of boxing too, because from what I know, boxing is one of the most uh, effective exercise to burn calories. Mm -hmm. So you burn a lot more calories than you running. Uh, so I want to learn to, you know, to throw a punch. So that's why we are adding boxing. Like we, we every other day probably we do boxing too. So what is it, what what exactly your fitness goal at the, at this point? Are you trying to lose weight or? build strength, put on muscle, um, or all at once? Yeah, I, I guess at, at this point, I, I watch a guy called um, Andy Galpin. Mm -hmm. So he's, a, he's, he's got a podcast called Perform. So I got to know him through a Huberman Lab. Mm -hmm. So he talks about, yes, there is the difference between um, power lifting and versus uh, building muscle, right? Um, so my goal is not to get overly big. I don't want to get too big that, that I'm uncomfortable in my mm -hmm. own body, right? Mm -hmm. I cannot scratch my back. <laughs> I don't want that uh, to happen to me. I want to instead be able to hike. So like m most of the gym people in, in my gym, for example, I'm sure mm -hmm. they cannot hike mm -hmm. any distance longer than three kilometers. I'm mm -hmm. sure they get over easily tired. But, 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 I, uh, but they all look like they, trucks. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, it's, I think Monsters. when you get really big, it only helps with mating. Uh, uh, no, 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 not, not, think, not exactly. Yeah, in, in my opinion, I don't think I don't think ladies are attracted to big overly, bulky bodies. Yeah, there was a guy. What's his name? He's all like right, Canadian please, guy. What's ladies, his name? let us know in the comments if you're attracted to <laughs> <laughs> big bulky uh, guys. Yes. I was like, it probably helps because if someone is too big, you get the impression that they are strong too mm -hmm. because there, there's a correlation, right? Mm -hmm. They might actually they might be just put to sleep by someone much skinnier, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. But I don't see any other benefits of that, honestly, mm -hmm. getting overly big. So my goal is to go down to like 12 percent mm -hmm. tish body percentage fat. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then I'm, I keep, but staying at that figure all year round is very difficult. That's lifestyle. But my lifestyle changes depending on how much I work. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, yeah, it's a very lifestyle D design thing basically mm -hmm. at this point like whether you are able to stay at certain figure um depends on your lifestyle mm -hmm. and the kinds of um you know lifestyle you are my lifestyle is not and i also when i go to the gym i realize these people's lifestyle allow that mm -hmm. and yours don't so i don't go too hard on myself if i am getting uh, a little bit of extra weight I will be like, okay, go easy on yourself. Don't mm -hmm. be too hard on yourself. That's okay to, mm -hmm. to have extra pound. You can share it, you know, mm -hmm. but it just takes some time. So as you know, most people can lose weight, but it's the, the problem is to keeping it off. Mm -hmm. So from what I know, the research tells us 
a lot of people can lose weight. The problem is, can you keep the weight off? Because 95% of the people gain the weight back, actually gain more weight than they lost. Mm -hmm. So in my um, case, um, I'm not married yet. So I, what I just want to be, when I have my children, I just want to be strong enough to be able to lift them, to have no issues and those kinds of things. I just mm -hmm. want to be fit for my family. Right. Um, yeah, that's the main thing, yeah. But I don't, I don't want to get overly mm -hmm. big. Yeah. So 12, 15% is good. Right, right. You, you, the, the, this part where you said that your life, lifestyle doesn't allow you to hit the gym as often, yes. as frequently, I, I used to think the same way until I realized that I, I had... My thinking was backwards. Like mm. I tried building my, I tried building my lifestyle. No, n not lifestyle. I, I built things like hitting the gym and self development around my lifestyle. Mm. But it wasn't working. So I did the, I reversed, I, I re engineered it. I did it backwards. So I put health productivity and self-development, personal development, and built my lifestyle around it. Mm. So what that means is, I, I, I think about the opportunity, most people think about the opportunity cost. They, they think the opportunity cost of me going to the gym for, and working out for an hour or two, right, and the, taking a shower and, uh, and it, all that takes, takes about two, three hours, is teaching one class. And, that, and within that time, I can make this much money. Yes. Right. That's what most people are usually thinking. Mm -hmm. Right. The opportunity, and that's what also what I used to think. But now I say to myself, the opportunity cost of uh, teaching a class and skipping the gym is having some kind of a heart attack when I'm fifty or sixty and losing ten thousand dollars for heart replacement mm -hmm. or some kind of treatment. Right. Yes. And that was a paradigm shift in my thinking. So ever since uh, whatever I do, I build the around the pillars of health, around the pillars of mm. uh, what really matter to me in life, which are health, fulfillment, and the relationships, yes. right? So I'm, I'm just putting this advice out there. Just you Yeah, know, I understand. Like, so you for, put... For people who... So most people, that's how they start as well. They, um, how do you get disciplined? They mm -hmm. say, rather than who want you want to become, mm -hmm. why don't you think about what you don't want to be, mm -hmm. all right? That negative, uh, I guess, image is actually a better um, prompter mm -hmm. uh, for you to take action, they say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So basically, that's what you're doing as well. Okay? So I don't, in my 50s, mm -hmm. I don't want to get a heart mm -hmm. attack. So mm -hmm. in my 30s and 20s, yeah. I need to eat clean. Mm -hmm. I need to hit the gym and mm -hmm. all, all the good stuff. Exactly. So I'm telling myself uh, every hour spent at the gym is... Is a is is two year investment into my life. Don't you think going to the gym is overrated? And you could just be mm -hmm. running or just uh, a few pull ups. And the, um, is it is it like because going to the gym is like investing mm -hmm. two or three hours mm -hmm. basically? You know, go to the gym, mm -hmm. uh, take a shower, and, mm -hmm. and then come back, and you know, all all of that mm -hmm. takes about two or three hours every day, right? right? right. So instead, so you could. Like I live, mm -hmm. I live in the apartment block. Mm -hmm. I was, I always think, why don't I just do a few pull-ups mm -hmm. and a few dips, um, like I don't know, ten sets of, um, you know, something like that. Why should I go to the gym? Is sometimes my thinking, mm -hmm. and I end up going to the gym anyways. But it's mm -hmm. like something that I'm, I've been wrestling with. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, to those people who say that, I'd probably say yes. You can absolutely get get great workout. Just staying home, doing some pull-ups, push-ups, body workout. Yes. That's what they call it. Just going for a light jog or just running around your neighborhood or whatnot. Uh, but when you have some kind of a gym membership and you don't have to go to one of those elite gyms where they charge yes. you $1,000 a year, right? Yeah. Uh, you can just go to a decent gym. You, f you, f you instantly get in the gear to get some work done. Yes. You want, once you're at the gym, because you're in that environment. Yes. Just as uh, there is a difference between doing homework or studying at home and studying at school. 
Yes. Yeah. When you're at home, you have your fridge, you have wi- Wi-Fi, you have TV, you have your bed. So uh, you you could actually get some work done, but that would take tr- that would take tremendous amount of discipline, tremendous amount of self control to be able to say no yeah. to those distractions. And the average person yeah. cannot do that. Yes. Right. Resist the temptations. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, I'm like. Now, I see my brother doing calisthenics. Uh-huh. Why don't I do the same, you know, basically? Uh-huh. Because he's got mm-hmm. much better core, I believe. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, yeah. okay. But generally, there are certain uh, exercises in the gym that you could mm-hmm. do with the equipment they have mm-hmm. that you wouldn't be able to emulate mm-hmm. in, with the home setup. Yeah, for sure, yes. for sure. It, it's not just about it. It's, it's, my, my point was more about the environment. It's like yes. when you see everyone is uh, doing something, doing something. They're lifting weights. They're all active, right? And you see they're in fantastic physique, right? You say, "Why not me?" All right, what am I doing? Yes. Right? You, you get propelled to do something, and you you kind of need sometimes need that push. You, you don't always have that push when you're at home. Yes. At home, we're usually surrounded with our parents, millennials, and. Yes. <laughs> They, they didn't, you know, really have much awareness around exercise and fitness growing up, right? Yes. But now there's so much content out there on the internet, trends and fitness. Everyone is into fitness. Yeah. So it's, it's a different generation we're talking about. Anyway, right. Uh, what are some, how much involved are you in fitness? Would you, like on a scale of zero to 10? Because... I, I I thought you were you know, deep into fitness, so I, I have some more specific questions prepared here about fitness. Yeah. So, so I would I've, say I I always played football. Uh-huh. Uh, I guess I'm quite athletic, uh-huh. so I've always played football, and I've I've always played football very well. People who know me that mm-hmm. uh, that I play football very well. Mm-hmm. Um, so and then I also play table tennis. So so. That um, I would say I'm quite athletic. So mm-hmm. I, I, if I'm not going to the gym, I'm doing push-ups. Mm-hmm. Like a, at any moment, I guess I can do at least ten dips. Mm-hmm. So um, I, 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 I think even with the extra weight that I have on mm-hmm. certain month mm-hmm. of the year, mm-hmm. I always can lift myself up. Mm-hmm. And then I think people judge your your health level by your mm-hmm. grips. Grip mm-hmm. strength, or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. important um, indicator, yeah. I believe. So generally, I, w- I would say I'm quite involved mm-hmm. in fitness. I'm quite quite a fit person. Mm-hmm. So if you could pick ten exercises and do them for the rest of your life, what would they be? So I think the list is um, going to be starting with obviously. Um, so I would do overhead press. Mm-hmm. Uh, for my shoulders, yeah, those. definitely. Then I will do squats. Mm-hmm. Um, I will definitely do and uh, traditional squat or Smith Smith machine. No traditional ones. Traditional, traditional ones. Yeah. And then I would definitely do deadlifts. Mm-hmm. Deadlifts are really important. And yeah, I would do definitely pull ups. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm need four of them, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would do pull ups, and um. I would do something for my chest. Um, I, honestly, I believe the most important thing for a man is their shoulders. Mm-hmm. If you have a wide shoulder. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I do lateral raises a lot mm-hmm. when I'm in the gym. I'm doing lots of lateral raises. Um, so that probably, lateral mm-hmm. raises. And then I guess overhead press also pretty mm-hmm. much. Uh, my The way... I exercise is different to how my brother exercise. He just divides the exercise into push and pull, basically mm-hmm. push and pull and leg. And so, but I just go with the certain muscle group and do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, off the top of my head, I, I don't. I guess at this point, I, I don't think I need really ten exercises. I can mm-hmm. I can live off with like live the rest of my life with five exercises to right. these. Uh, the uh, th- those are actually really important yes, exercises, yes. and a lot of them are compound moves. Yes, you mentioned deadlift. Yes, what's your what's your PR? Um, I at this point I'm not doing deadlifts anymore. I like mm-hmm. the like. When I was in my previous gym, in my from my previous gym, it's called Crocus Fit. Mm-hmm. There are lots of popular guys now. Like mm-hmm. there is, uh, they, these are all professional people, very dedicated to their craft. I I used to see them deadlifting very like heavy weights, and mm-hmm. I used to be into that too. Then someone from there told me your form is really bad. 
Mm-hmm. All right, and then you're going to mess up your core. They said not not core, your back. Yeah, my back. You yes. gotta watch your back. Yes. Buddy. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna. I was actually lifting quite a heavy weight. Mm-hmm. It was I don't know, one forty, one sixty. I don't remember. Yes, and and then I stopped doing that. And then I've been doing this exercise. My brother is telling me, you know, you put your like hand, mm-hmm. uh, you know, your, your back. And then do this, but because my back is quite stiff at this mm-hmm. point, it doesn't, it's really stiff. I need to make sure it's like more flexible. Mm-hmm. So we're working on that with my brother. Mm-hmm. So I'm mostly now doing overhead press and squats, mm-hmm. uh, like that, that lifts not, not anymore. Um, so once we get it fixed and then I changed my gym because the, the previous gym was really good. There was lots of inspiration for me. There were lots of big guys. Um, there's a lot of injections, a lot of steroid used to, obviously, because most the average person thinks that you can get that big quite fast with just being natural, right? That's not possible. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I see any big guy, uh, like, I'm like, mm-hmm. I know that they have, have used juice. Um, and for me now, it's important that I care more about other things. Um, that I don't, f- I, I have good enough energy and that I have my skin cleaned. Mm-hmm. So, and for that, I need to get my fixed diet fixed. So at this point, I was dieting before I start, uh, before I hit the road. So, and I, once I hit the road, I started eating uh, junk food again. <laughs> so, but before I came to Navai, Bukhara, Samarkand, I was on a seven day diet, meat diet, only mm-hmm. meat. That's called, there is a new diet called PSMF. Mm-hmm. That's called protein. It's keto, next level keto, basically. Mm-hmm. Next, you just only eat uh, like uh, protein, but on, on low calorie. What it does, it burns your fat. Now, you burn you. Your weight might be pretty much the same, but mm-hmm. you sometimes feel. But you are your fat is also burning. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, like they say, oh, there are no fat burning mm-hmm. um, exercises or like equipment, but it actually does. But you need to do it with your doctor's recommendation mm-hmm. because you should not overdo it. So most people they do it in four week cycle, then they go back to their usual uh, routine in two weeks, and then that's how I do it. Th- that's what I was doing too. But I did it one day. And I went down from nine to five to uh, nine to two, very fast. You weigh ninety plus kilos. Yes. Yeah. I, no, you don't now, actually look ninety plus yeah, kilos. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm nine to two now. Wow. I'm nine to two. This guy is thirty kilos heavier than me. Yes. Thirty. I'm, I'm sixty-five. So you're sixty-five. I'm sixty-five. No, I'm, but I'm nine to five. Yeah. No, no, I'm nine to two right now. Right, nine to. I, I'm not I sure. Mean, still, though, I thought I thought you weigh like something like seventy, seventy-five, but ninety-five. Right. Yes, I, I think it's like my bones probably quite heavier. Uh-huh. The, probably that's what the case is. Because right. my mom tells me that when I was born, um, I need to do research if that's true. Mm-hmm. My mom tells me, I think how much you are you weighing when you are born probably dictates mm-hmm. uh, your predisposition, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, she tells me that when I was born, I was 3.6 kg. Mm-hmm. 3.6 kg. And then my brother, who's also on the you know, heavier side, let's go with that. Mm-hmm. Like he's also, he was also born this way. But mm-hmm. my two other brothers, because there are four of us, they were much, um, you know, lighter mm-hmm. and they are also leaner now, mm-hmm. probably. That's the theory, our family's theory. <laughs> so <laughs> right. um, probably that. I was probably, mm-hmm. when I was born, b- born with heavier bones probably. Right. Yeah, it's a... This exercise is a big topic. It's there. There are so many facets to it: diet, yes. supplementation, and different body workout splits. And it's become a billion dollar industry now. It is. I think what people should realize: mm-hmm. just stick to the diet that mm-hmm. you can stick to. Mm-hmm. What I mean, if it's sustainable for me, keto is only the way to lose weight. Mm-hmm. I don't. I guess there are lots of benefits. Mm-hmm. If I'm on a, on a twenty day keto, my skin is much better all over my body, mm-hmm. all right? So if I'm only eating protein, but I once watched this podcast episode where they're talking about how you should limit your carb intake mm-hmm. to 150 grams. Mm-hmm. So um, do, you, do you actually have the time to measure how much, how many carbs or how many protein you're having a day? Because like I used to be that guy, honestly. Mm. I used to track every single calorie count, like a protein and carb. And then I realized, well, if I'm just on caloric deficit, 
It doesn't yes. matter what I'm eating. Yes. I'm losing weight. Yeah, that's the that's the video. That, what's his name? The guy is really mm -hmm. popular, Alex Hormozy. Mm -hmm. He puts out a lot of content saying that I just get my 200 grams of mm -hmm. protein every day and I don't care about what I eat. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably true, but in Uzbekistan, it's quite difficult because you cannot always uh, measure. It's very easy to improve your carb intake. And then the, the more carb there is, there is more... Uh, calories in it right mm -hmm. so we tend to eat very very calorie dense foods so it's important that you watch that you're not e eating too many you know carbohydrates mm -hmm. so but it's very difficult because all the good foods that we have in uzbekistan are rich in calorie like carbohydrates um so it's important for me to diet but i also need to be very mindful of like of the fact that i'm not you know letting other you know important factors go down like mm -hmm. my friend was telling me you are uh, on a meat diet but I, are you are you making sure that you're taking vitamins and drinking a lot of like a lot of water as well and he was telling me that and i wasn't doing that and i was like okay okay now i need to get those uh, factors improved too um but generally yeah i think as long as you do something sustainable you're good like keto wasn't sustainable for me but i only do it to lose weight but at mm -hmm. this for the past six months and some of my friends were recognizing that seeing that you're big yo-yo yo dieting you lose weight you gain weight you lose weight you gain weight so i need to craft a diet that allows me to stay fit mm -hmm. all year round mm -hmm. so um, so far not luck. <laughs> yes. Yeah, keep experimenting. Yeah, yeah, keep yeah, experimenting. Keep, yes. So probably right. once I have like that one hour walk around my neighborhood habit, really a regular habit, I think I, I'll I'll be there. I'll mm -hmm. be there because uh, I sometimes do that. Like I, and I use my phone app to mm -hmm. check if I'm doing that. Um, yeah, I'm a regular mm -hmm. in this habit. Right. We did quite a bit of talking about gym workout. Now, on the next chapter of the podcast, I want to talk about something more personal. And feel free if you yes. don't want to talk about that, right? So, as someone bachelor, yes, you are you thinking about marriage already, or is that something far into the in the in the future? Is that something you not? I am considering. Yeah, at I this guess point I'm not right really now. considering this at least this year. It's something mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. I have um, time for, basically. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's not something you need to rush. It's mm -hmm. Like I'm not um, marrying someone just because you know, I they happen to think that I all tick the boxes, mm -hmm. and I think the other person tick all the boxes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very difficult to happen. Obviously, someone mm -hmm. to to have, you know, you you, that, you know, that's cool. that's and marriage is more than that, I believe. Um, but generally, I'm not really rushing because I think you need to be really ready for that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure in terms of my involvement in work with the kind of um, investment. Uh, I'm I guess I'm quite invested in my job right now. That uh, marriage is a big project uh, that I'm not ready for yet. So once I am ready, mm -hmm. then I think I'll, I'll, I'll get married. But there is obviously a lot of pressure from my parents because they think I'm too old at this point. <laughs> but I don't think 20, 26 is too old. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like I'm close to 30. Somehow, stereotypically speaking, 30 is the, the age. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you're 30, you, you, you're basically old. Yeah. Uh, but I think I have enough time for you know, turning, mm -hmm. <laughs> pushing, for, be, for me to be pushing 30. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm, I guess... I'm in the okay green zone right yeah. now. So I tell my parents, come on, I'm, I'm, I'm 26. Mm -hmm. I think they look at me as if I'm 26, mm -hmm. but I look at it, I'm 26, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> so there are, there are ways to look at it. Right. So, and I, like, if you think about someone who finished university, right? They are mm -hmm. 22. And then someone 22 is inexperienced, I believe to start a family, right? And then they need a few year, more years for them to like have a job, you know, do something and then actually amount to something. You know, I, that's not to say that I amounted to something, but I, at least I'm still experimenting with things for me to be, okay, I'm, 
I'm like, oh, I'm okay with this. Now I, I need that time for me to work on that aspect. Then probably I get married. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm not really rushing. I think hopefully the parents of whoever girl I happen to marry understand that, that I was taking this time to do that because depending on the kind of background they come from, I, obviously you need to match someone who understands your decisions and the, the kinds of things that you've gone through. Mm -hmm. So yeah, hopefully that happens. Like you said, it's really hard to find someone who ticks all the boxes, right? Yes. But I'm guessing you still, you, you anyway have those boxes, don't you? Do like, I have uh, the boxes to, to tick? Yeah. Of like, course. So what I'm, what that I are non-negotiables. Yeah. That what, are non what, what, I, what I want to ask is like, what are some things you look for in your future partner? Um, or, and what are those non-negotiables? I think that they need to be supportive. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think for you to know if that person is supportive, you need to date them for a while mm -hmm. like all right and then how their conflict management some people like shut down all the ways you can communicate with them and then they never allow you to have a conversation they will be like okay fine what's in my head mm -hmm. and that's childish way of resolving a conflict yeah you know? really immature. Uh, yes it's like you need to give them a problem mm -hmm. and then maybe sometimes intentionally create a problem and then see how they how react. they react right so it's like if they, in the face in the face of a problem, if they mm -hmm. react like a child, then you you're not mm -hmm. you'll be like okay, you're not ready for for marriage yet, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I, I need to see myself too. Am I ready for like for for example? I remember I was 18 year old, and I was reading a book called Bakhtiyar Oyle, mm -hmm. and I was like that's and I then took a uh, what's that? Took a bird's eye view of the the situation, and I was like, dear Beck, you are 18. You've never actually dated a girl and you're reading a book about Bakhtiyar Oyle and then you don't even know what a girl wants. You've never been in a relationship. You think what you know is uh, like, I, I think before you start actually dating someone, you think you like that in a girl, but then you learn that it's actually something you don't like in a girl. Or you think that you want that thing, but actually you don't like that thing. So actually now compare that level of uh, reflection to someone you are dating with, to someone you are living with. So I was like, okay, that's, there's no point in hitting the books and, you know, mm -hmm. learning the theory. It's like, it's actually a, a, like doing things, right? I was like, okay, that's not going to work out. Instead, you should actually see what, what, what a girl, um, what, what it's like to be in a relationship with a girl. And I was like, okay, gave up on reading the book thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So, yeah. yeah. But when it comes to non-negotiables, their conflict, um, you know, ma management is the most important thing, I believe. It's like, do they understand where... And then are they supportive? Mm -hmm. Like, are, are they supportive through thick and thin? Like, I, can, I guess you can test that. Um, so, yeah, and also, and I don't believe that your wife needs to be extremely intelligent because all the genes are from her because that's not true. Mm -hmm. Your genes going to your kid too. So like, you know, <laughs> half the genes yours, half the genes yours probably. So um, if she is of similar intellect, um, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you, you can talk about, so at times she can be deep, at times she can be funny. So if you are like really having a deep, meaningful conversation and she can have that, she's not too stupid to you know, to not, to be able to talk about, she generally needs to be interested in things and not just things in what sense, not material things, but generally things around mm -hmm. her, but not overly materialistic. I hate overly materialistic girls. Mm -hmm. So if she's overly materialistic, my life is ruined, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, not that I'm afraid of, you know, not being able to like satisfy, probably, you know what I mean? It's like, but is this what life is for? I don't mm -hmm. think so. So that's why I, I don't like overly materialistic girls. So these three things. Uh, because, see, yeah. These two qualities are hard to, they don't really, they don't really com combine. Those, those, those sort of in always, they go hand in hand. I think if you want someone intelligent, then you should expect them to be to, to a great extent materialistic because intelligent people know that if they want to be able to express their intelligence, they need to have some kind, some amount of power. Yes. And that power usually comes from having a ton of cash yes. or owning things, right? So it's, it's kind of really hard to find that balance of intelligence and, and that, and that self 
control yes. that 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 allows the the girl to keep their ego in check. Yes, right. It's really hard to find that because I, I I sometimes observe people too. Like I'm yes. not gonna lie if I say that I don't pay attention to things. Right when I'm interacting with ladies, yes, and I do. What I've realized is those ladies who are intelligent, they want to convert that intelligence into some kind of a asset. Mm. A tangible asset. So there is that level of materialism in them that obviously we are all them. materialistic right. to a certain degree. For example, this watch I'm wearing, mm. uh, do I really need it? Uh-huh. Uh, can I live without it? Yes, yeah. probably. But still, um, I I I have that. I, I'm not. I'm talking about that. The level of materialism that's too extreme. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that that's that's not. I guess something mm-hmm. I don't in, uh, I don't look favorably upon a girl. So you know have you mean? ever met anyone who m- meet or match remotely any of those criteria? No, it's it's like I don't want to be like maybe there is this, you need to also meet their expectations too. Like did mm-hmm. I meet someone like that? Yes, of course. There uh-huh. are lots of girls like that. I don't really agree with people who say, "Oh, there are no good girls." No, there are <laughs> lots of good girls. It's just these girls that you have like um what, what's the word the, you are lo- looking at a girl who has the qualities you're looking for mm-hmm. and then if you have all the good qualities then they have really high expectations too mm-hmm. you, it's not you need to live up to their expectations too like it's like it's really difficult to be you know mm-hmm. expecting like to be meet, mm-hmm. meeting each other's expectations so mm-hmm. probably uh, I met someone. Mm-hmm. Maybe I didn't meet their expectations uh-huh. you know, in certain ways. Probably, uh-huh. I never actually. Like at this point, my parents are like, "You're not meeting anybody. What are you doing with your life?" You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I'm like, "No, I'm at this point focused on my work." So can you guys let me give me a few more years, uh, like so that I'm more involved in mm-hmm. my uh, business mm-hmm. and and make it successful. So I'm 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 not really uh, focused on that yet. You know what I mean? It's like. It's something I can deal with in the future. Mm-hmm. So it's just, I believe even if there's someone you like is not someone you actively search. They just come into your life. All right. It could be in a cafe with your friends and then you meet someone and you approach them and like you just need to have guts to approach them probably. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like it's never you actively search for them. Yeah. Uh, like I, I don't think that's how it works. I just know, uh, at least I have uh, faith in the fact that, I think it's a fact, you just meet someone who's uh, suitable for you. Mm-hmm. It's like, um, you just need they to have... call it destiny? Yeah, <laughs> probably people call it destiny. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. there's a word for that, like your, your colleague said. So um, I, I guess that's hap- going to happen. I'm just, I'm okay with that. So yeah. as long as I keep pushing myself, that I'm a, I'm a better a person every day, mm-hmm. then probably there is someone who match my expectations right. as well. So what, what are some lessons you would teach your future kids? You want to teach your future kids. Now, what are some um, things that I want to teach? Mm-hmm. That you would, lessons you would want to impart on your kids? Um, okay, that's something I've never thought before. So um, I think I want to first of all t- uh, teach them that um, it's important to manage money you know what i mean i think i think i need to give them small tasks so mm-hmm. that they can manage money mm-hmm. so i think i've made for Uzbekistan, some i there are years i made good amount of money but i think i made shitty purchases shitty mm-hmm. investments and mm-hmm. then i was like i i'll be sometimes looking at my uh, how much money i made and like mm-hmm. where that money went i think so the the rich people are, know how to do that from a young age for example, if you look at billionaires, they come from a background where they know how to handle money. Mm-hmm. They always had, I guess, money talk. Uh, the money talk that they have is different to the kind of money talk you have as if, if you're coming from a middle, um, you know, middle class background. So, so in Uzbekistan, what's middle class? In Uzbekistan, middle class is someone who's got a house to their name and a car, right? And depending on the expensiveness price of the car i think it d- d- determines uh whether you are upper middle class or lower middle class or somewhere mm. in the in the middle right um the middle class is has the middle too uh but like 
I think I want to first of all teach that, like to teach them. Hopefully, I will be in a in a financial situation where I will be able to teach them how to handle money, so that they will. Uh, I will do my best to create generational wealth. However, like like I do my best because I don't think thirty is the age where you should stop working hard. You know, like everybody, like you should work hard until mm-hmm. you're the age of th- until you turn thirty. What's wrong with working until you're 40? Like, or 50 yeah, or 60. 50, yes. I want to continue working so hard. I mean, Warren Buffett is 90 or something. He's yes, still working. Yeah, he yes. still goes to work. He's got all the cash in the uh-huh. world, right? Right now. Um, so I will be like, I will mm. be, I will want to be just working so hard so that my kids have that, uh, you, know, you know, opportunity, mm-hmm. you know, so that they can um, continue or they can build up on the wealth that I've accumulated. Mm-hmm. Right, an important lesson to teach yes. your kids. <sighs> wow, uh, that's that's a lot of useful insights and knowledge you're sharing here today. And we're we're actually about to wrap up this podcast, yes. but before we do that, there are a few more questions I want to get through. So it's a somewhat of a tradition here on the podcast to finish things off on a philosophical note, mm-hmm. and uh, I have a a set of three questions I want to ask somewhat philosophical. So my, my first question is like, what, what, how would you define your personal philosophy? What's something that guides you? What's something that's at the core, at the core, the center of your existence? So I would say be a good person, mm-hmm. uh, leave a good name. That's it. Mm-hmm. So everything else is like, like comes with that. Mm-hmm. If you're a good person, uh, you can define what a good person using, Theological arguments, you can define it with secular texts, whatever means you use. I don't think they are contradicting each other. Mm-hmm. There's lots of overlap. So be a good person and I'll leave a good name. That's what I want to, um, you know, that's my, that's what I want my legacy to be, just mm-hmm. to leave a good name. Right. Yes. And, and, and if you could travel back in time and talk to your younger self, what's one piece of advice you would give him? That... Um, oh, the one advice is just pursue your interests. Um, things will just work out fine because I believe I had other interests which I didn't pursue. Mm -hmm. I think I would definitely tell them to pursue their interests because my younger self was overly realistic that, oh, Mm -hmm. this is not going to work because you live in a corrupt country. There's lots Mm -hmm. of corruption. Mm -hmm. This dream of yours is not going to be working out because mm. because someone you know etc so i would probably tell them you know to pursue their dreams probably yeah even if like um yeah i think i i had other some other interests that i didn't pursue which i think should have been pursued yes right yes. so go and chase your dreams yes. right and this is one, some one message you'd have for our younger audience oh, as of well. course yes uh, but also with this good level of self-awareness and being pragmatic as well mm-hmm. all right yes but don't let the pragmatic side of yourself dictate all the mm-hmm. terms and conditions yeah. right. <laughs> so yes right there's that uh, this concept about a, a child version of us living in us and as yes. we grow older it starts uh, getting quieter and quieter and quieter mm-hmm. and disappears and we lose our ability to dream so if yes. you look at uh, our parents or or people about our age, they stop dreaming because they think things not possible anymore. Yes. Yeah. You want to hold on to that child. You want to keep that child yes. alive who can dream, who's capable of dreaming. Say, this podcast is right now being watched, yes. most probably by your future you. Yes. I'm guessing you're going to come back and watch this podcast yes. when it's out. So what's one message you have to that guy, to your future self? Um. To the guy who's watching it in, <laughs> in about a week, hopefully. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, probably in two, three weeks because two, three weeks. we have two unreleased podcasts. So, to the guy who's watching, to uh-huh. pick, your second branch will be successful. Uh-huh. Don't worry. You're worrying too much, probably. Um, so, you're okay even if it doesn't work out because you're worrying too much mm-hmm. that if it doesn't work out, if you don't do it, you would still regret that you didn't mm-hmm. do it. So, you did take the chance. I think you're now happy that you did it because it's the end of September and then numbers are good. Mm-hmm. So I think you're happy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, a little bit specific in that in that yeah. regard, I guess. Mr. Diarbek, yes. it was it was a lot of fun talking to you yeah, today. Yeah, it was a lot of fun I, talking to you too. I I want to sincerely thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing with us, with me, with our audience, uh, your personal stories, your experiences, uh, useful insights about uh, IELTS, running a school, and and everything. And I'm I'm in your debt, right? Yes, I I appreciate you inviting me as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank so you for watching us. <laughs> if you have any final comments or re remarks you want to make before the podcast, ends. yeah, I wish I wish you guys uh, continue, um, you know, offering a platform for people to, you know, have a genuine conversation. I really like myself having conversations. Like that's why probably I like watching dialogue-driven movies. Mm -hmm. And like my favorite movies, um, usually something where there are lots of dialogue happening. Mm -hmm. So I wish you guys the best of luck uh, the, to, to the two guys who are helping make it happen and the host as well. So yeah, I wish you guys all the best of luck and you invite lots of guests and then the audience who's watching getting a lot of insights. Maybe there is one piece of advice that they liked mm -hmm. or there is a lesson that the lesson that they took away. Um, whatever they have, you know, happen to be finding useful, hopefully that's a lot of impact. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, you hopefully you continue making a positive impact um and there's also you know audience from abroad probably wanted to um, yeah if you guys find out that we exist <laughs> um it's great all right okay all right guys hope you enjoyed today's episode and if you liked our content don't forget to like subscribe and leave your comments in the comment section below i'll see you in the next one peace